So according to Vera Songwe, who is the executive secretary at the Economic Commission for Africa, ECA, African countries will need to tackle the aftermath of COVID-19 very boldly, needs a lot of boldness that has never been seen before in order for African countries to tackle the af aftermath of COVID-19 and also to recover their economies and achieve growth. She also suggests that science, technology and innovation are critical to helping African countries to um, revive their economies. Things, business is no longer, is, business is no longer, is no longer business as usual. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our webinar where we'll be speaking about the effects of COVID-19 on the Nigerian mining industry. We'll also be looking at the opportunities that are available for the sector to recover. I'd like to thank our, our speaker, our keynote speaker, the Honorable Minister of Mines and Steel Development, architect Olami Lekon Adegbite. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. Thank you for accepting to give the keynote address. I would like to also welcome and thank Dr. Uchechuku Samson Oga, the Honorable Minister of State for Mines and Steel Development. He will be giving us the closing remarks at the end of the webinar. I would also like to thank Mr. Edet Sunday Akpan, the Permanent Secretary for the Ministry of Mines and Steel Development. Uh, he's also the co-chair for the Mining and Manufacturing Policy Commission within the Ministry of Mines and Steel Development. So like me, he has his day job at the ministry and his night job at the Nigerian Economic Summit Group. I'd like to thank our distinguished discussants. There are six of us, six discussants. I'd also like to thank the listeners, all participants. Thank you for giving us your time this morning. We now go straight into the business of the day. Permanent Secretary, sir, please give uh, thank us you your very much. opening remarks. Thank you very much. If, if, if we're not speaking, the panelists, discussants, please can you mute your. Yes. Please mute if you are not to speak. I'm also muting now. The permanent secretary is muted, so. Permanent secretary, sir, we can't hear you because you're muted. Sam, sir, please unmute yourself, sir. We can hear you now, Piers. Please go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much. Honorary Minister, sir, the Honorary Minister of State, the CEO of Nigerian Economic Summit Group, and other discussants, or other, and other members of the group, distinguished discussants, members of the press, ladies and gentlemen. Pleasure, sir, to join you and others at this webinar session on post-COVID-19 Nigeria on the mining industry, organized today by the organizers to extend the compliments and good wishes of the Honorary Minister, uh, Honorary Minister of State, who are already here for this event. And again, members of development on this very auspicious occasion. I would also like to thank in particular the leadership of the NESG, Mr. Laoye Tayoba, uh, Tayola, sorry, for the interest he has shown to join hand with Federal Minister of Mines and Sea Development to develop the Nigerian 
sector of that, the, 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 the mining and steel sector of the economy. Uh, of course, he is in line with the president's focus on economy. Now, in meeting with the challenges of the present time, the ministry has undertaken some progressive steps to break the gaps and boost development in the mining sector. Among these include the creation of a roadmap for the growth and development of the Nigerian mining industry. The roadmap put in proper perspective the role of the ministry at tackling some of the problems that include lack of bankable geological data, weak institutional capacity, inadequate supporting infrastructure, low productivity, illegal mining, weak implementation and enforcement of mining law and regulations. There are also the issues of insufficient funding, which is key for exploration and production. We also have the problem of poor perception, which the government and the ministry is taking a lot of effort to make sure these are addressed. Although progress has been recorded so far in these areas, the emergence of the coronavirus pandemic, that is COVID-19, has very drastically affected the milestone achieved and may very significantly influence the way things are done post-COVID-19. The great lockdown, as uh, the pandemic has been described by the International Monetary Fund IMF, has brought about protocols such as social distancing, self-isolation, et cetera. And as such, businesses and industries have been shut down, or at best, drops in global prices have been experienced, and local and global demand for various metals and minerals have also plugged. Consequently, ladies and gentlemen, royalty and tax payments have reduced in tandem with the fall in production and revenues. The great lockdown has disrupted and appeared to be threatening to destroy an already fragile sector and might present a huge setback for Nigeria and Nigerian miners. But even at that, we have a duty to meet the medium-term and long-term plans at ensuring the sector's contribution to the GDP from 0.33% in 2015 as it is to about 3.0% by the year 2050. And we hope to make sure this is achieved. So ladies and gentlemen, allow me at this point to say that the ministry has, in line with the objective of the existing roadmap, begun the National Integrated Mineral Exploration Project, which aim at providing reliable ge geosciences data for some key minerals such as gold, lead, zinc, iron ore, and rare metals, among others. Also, some sections of the Jakuta Sea Company Limited were renovated and upgraded recently, and discussions are ongoing, including the dedicated effort of the Jakuta Project Presidential Implementation Team to ensure the revamp of the Jakuta the National Iron Ore Mining Company Limited and others, all to make sure, certain that the reborn of the... It is therefore clear that the ministry is open to innovation and development. The ministry and your organization, the NESG, hopefully through this webinar shall be confronting these real issues and should be able to create avenues for promoting mineral linkages that is upstream, downstream, and other infrastructure to, to meet the needs of the Nigerian economy. I want to believe that the outcome of this exercise will contribute to various efforts to boost investment and diversification of the Nigerian economy. And we can then begin to prepare the sector to become more resilient to external shocks in the future. In the course of this webinar, discussion may attract ideas that are tailored towards the principles of the African mining vision, the continental framework for mineral based industrialization, which was anchored on mineral linkages and diversification. I say this because the 2020 work plan for the mining thematic group is geared towards leveraging the mining sector for broader development outcomes. Consequently, as participants 
at this uh, webinar, it is important to expect that the presentations and discussion will touch on one, examining the issues raised by COVID-19 and its effect on the global and national mining and mineral industry and value chain. Two, assessing and discussing what the sector needs to do for the short-term recovery and post-crisis period in terms of preparedness, responsiveness, and readiness. And finally, incorporating the effects of COVID-19 and its opportunities the charting a rapid transformation of the mining industry, as well as catalyzing the sector for broad-based development in the long term. So in ending this remark, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to invite you all to take advantage of the opportunities this webinar will provide by unraveling gaps, both present and in the near future, the regulators, administrators, and investors can assimilate to discuss for further uplifting of the Nigerian mining sector. On this note, ladies and gentlemen, I wish all participants a very excellent and fruitful discussion. Thank you for your listening. Thank you, Permanent Secretary, for opening the event. We would now like to welcome the co-chair for the Mining and Manufacturing Policy Commission, Engineer Ahmed Mansour, who is also the president of the Min Manufacturers Association of Nigeria, to give his welcome address, please. Good morning, all. My name is Tochuku uh, Chimubangwa. I am representing the President of Man, Engineer Ahmed Mansour. I want to stand on existing protocols and go straight to the welcome address. The, on behalf of our President, I would like to extend a warm welcome to everyone joining in on today's webinar. Allow me to especially appreciate the Honorable Minister of Mines and Steel, Architect Olamileko Adet Bite, distinguished members of the panel, the public and private sector co chairs, members of the steering committee of the Mining and Manufacturing Policy Commission of Nigeria Economic Summit Group, as well as members of the Mining Thematic Group. Thank you all for taking out the time to share with us your knowledge and experiences. The theme of this webinar is extremely apt, which is post-COVID-19 Nigeria, opportunities and impact on the mining industry. As we are aware, the devastating effect of COVID-19 pandemic caught the global community unaware, thereby imposing severe hardship on our lives, our economy, and disrupting the system as well as our social norms as never witnessed in the history of mankind. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, as Nigeria's foremost economic think tank, an assemblage of intellectuals and experienced professionals, the NESG will be required at times like this to assist the country in resolving, particularly the economic challenges that the pandemic has foisted on our nation as part of the global community. In line with this objective, I join other well-meaning Nigerians to urge us as a group and as a nation not to be discouraged in the travails of this time, but to see this time as an opportunity to harness the God-given endowment of our nation, particularly the natural resources, which we have in abundance, to address this issue of development that has enrolled our country in the league of underdeveloped nations of the world. In conclusion, I'm confident that the mining team group is capable and well positioned to come up with articulated and practical agenda for our country in positioning the mining and manufacturing industries to play their key roles as sectors that can complement each other and lead our nation to the League of Industrialized Nations post-COVID-19 pandemic, which by the special grace of God is already in sight. Once again, I thank you all and wish us all successful deliberations. On behalf of Engineer Mansour Ahmed, 
President of Manufacturers Association of Nigeria. Thank you all. Thank you, Engineer Mansour Ahmed, for the welcome address. We would now move on to the Honorable Minister of Mines and Steel Development, Architect Olami Lekon Adibite, who will give us his keynote address, which is really about setting the agenda for our discussions today. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, thank you so much, Amanda. And good morning, everyone. Uh, it's nice to be with you this morning, uh, especially Mr. Jayola. Thank you for inviting me to this. Uh, I wish to commend the Nigeria Economic Summit Group for its efforts, especially at this time, to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on the Nigerian economy. I understand that you have already organized similar webinars for sports and digital economy. And of course, coming uh, to mining now will be beneficial and far reaching uh, for the country. This webinar to discuss the opportunities and impact of COVID-19 pandemic on the Nigerian mining industry is timely. The immediate focus of government and of course uh, other operators had been to manage the health safety, health and safety of the impact of COVID-19. And of course, economy being uh, the third one, albeit surprised. But now as we're looking uh, towards the end of the COVID-19, post-COVID-19, uh, there's that realization that we need to put more effort into the economic uh, risk that have come with the lockdown. The double-ended shock of the COVID-19 pandemic and the consequent sharp decline in oil prices has led to a revenue shortfall for the country. The administration of uh, the president, President Muhammad Bari, of course, I've been making efforts to diversify the economy of, away from oil and gas through the development of mining and agricultural sector. These efforts are now being fast tracked. It's something that has been coming uh, for a while, but now the reality is upon us. We need to fast track these efforts. Mining offers robust economic potential to diversify the economy, create jobs, and increase government revenue which is our core mandate, the core mandate of the sector. Nigeria, as it were, we are endowed with over 44 different mineral types, which occurs in over 500 locations across the 36 states and the federal capital territory in Nigeria. Seven of these minerals have been designated as strategic to unlock the enormous potential in the sector. These seven minerals are coal, iron ore, bitumen, gold, limestone, lead, zinc, and barite. Alongside the seven strategic minerals, the ministry is also looking into key minerals to fuel the future. These include metals such as titanium, tungsten, lithium, cobalt. These are various applications in futuristic industries such as aerospace, telecoms, electric vehicle manufacturing, and others. The Nigerian Mining Industry Roadmap, formulated in 2016, highlights clear policy direction on how to develop the sector, which we have continuously improved upon to unlock the potential in this sector. The structural reforms we have embarked upon in the industry are geared towards supporting the emergence of a vibrant private sector and to sim stimulate resource-based in industrialization. It is predicated on the principle that government serves as a regulator, providing an enabling environment for businesses to thrive. I will 
quickly highlight some of the reform achievements which have helped to de-risk the sector, thus making it investor friendly. One of these is the artisanal and small scale mining remote sensing monitoring system. This is to regulate and support the ASM activities. This is geared towards job creations, which is one of the core mandates I mentioned earlier. Organizing, providing services for the artisanal miners and small scale miners in the field, providing them with equipment so as to enhance their productivity and also to introduce safety into their operations. This is one. Secondly, we're about completing the automation of the mining cadastral system to meet international uh, standards for online title and license applications. Of course, this eliminates administrative bureaucracy while improving the ease of doing business in Nigeria mining sector. Either though, mining in Nigeria is mostly based on uh, artisanal and small scale mining and government is Continuous, we are trying to attract the big mining players into Nigeria. And these are some of the reforms that are geared towards that. Our mining cadastral system is now being automated and it can be accessed online from anywhere in the world. Also, in partnership with the British Geological Survey, we are establishing a Nigeria Geodata Center at the Nigerian Geological Survey Agency. This is to ease online access to geological maps and data sets for use in academia, investment decisions, and general research purposes. These last two coupled together will avail international investors information, data that they can use to access the Nigerian mining sector. And we are getting good results on this. The recent establishment of the Investment Promotion and Mineral Trade Department in the ministry demonstrated the zeal and preparedness, preparedness to welcome investment partners. We have put in place incredible incentives to support investors and to unlock the sector. These incentives include customs and import duty waivers for plant machinery and equipment imported strictly for mining. There's a tax holiday of between three to five years as applicable for investors. Free transferability of capital and permission to retain and use end foreign exchange. Four. Capital allowances of up to 95% of qualifying capital expenditure. And lastly, 100% ownership of mineral properties. These are incentives that are geared towards foreign investors who are coming to Nigerian shores. At this junction, I equally wish to point out some ongoing initiatives that we have designed to support the sector one of which is the optimization of our mineral value chain, what you call the mineral downstream uh, sector policy. The ultimate objective of this is to minimize the export of raw materials, creating value along the chain that will increase industrial and manufacturing activities in Nigeria, create employment and foster skills development. Presently, our priority is anchored in the gold sector. We are creating a gold ecosystem to minimize the high rates of illegal gold mining and smuggling, which of course is very prevalent at this time. This is to increase government revenue from the resource, create jobs and improve environmental and social stewardship. One of the efforts to tackle this gold initiative is what you call PAGMI, Presidential Artisanal Gold Mining Initiative. This is geared towards organizing, formalizing, and equipping artisanal and small-scale gold miners in Nigeria 
so government can be the off-takers. This, the pilot program for this PAGME is ongoing in Kaduna, Kaduna State, Kebi State, Oshun State, Niger, and Zamfara State. These are the five states where the pilot is starting on gold, the PAGME. Two companies, towards this, two companies, Ken Smith and Dukia Gold Limited, have been licensed. They've been granted license to refine gold in Nigeria, and both are in the process of building their refineries. Miners of precious metal and uh, industrial minerals will be linked to former markets that government is creating through this licensed private mineral buying centers. One of such is the one we just launched recently, the Dukia Heritage Bank Buying Center. Essentially, what this does is the artisanal miners are encouraged to sell their products to government licensed buying centers. What had happened in the past, and which encouraged a lot of illegality, is foreigners who come into Nigeria to participate on the back of that snow mining uh, process. Of course, they rip off these artisanal miners, don't buy at the proper price. Government is still trying to win these people off these illegal uh, miners. So by approaching the licensed mineral buying centers, you get full value for what you realize and government eliminates the illegality in the process and government derive revenue that is due to it. We are trying as part of the downstream uh, policy to enhance employment and increase revenue to government. We are trying to stimulate mineral processing across the country using cluster or hub approach. Each cluster will be provided with road and rail infrastructure and also power infrastructure. This is to encourage investors in the processing and refining equipment to come in there to support a network of miners which are attached to that hub and the processors. Government is providing rail, road, and power, especially through gas. The central corridor that comes from Ajaokuta to Wari is being enhanced towards this. Uh, presently, there's a gas line that runs from Alaja in Wari uh, to uh, Ajaokuta. Also, there's a rail line that runs from Alaja to Ajaokuta. This was essentially done for the Ajaokuta plant itself. But government is using this as a, a mineral hub along that line, expanding the rail, the rail line to Wari Port, at the same time, taking the rail line to Abuja to link with the Abuja Cardinal uh, Rail. Also, the gas pipeline is being taken up north via Abuja to Kaduna and Kano. And this forms a central spine for the mineral activity uh, 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 operating in that access. In the longer term, the upgrade, completion, and operation of Ajakuta steel plant will enhance jobs and revenue generation. The project is based on a bilateral agreement between Nigeria and Russia, the, gov the two governments, with funding coming from the Averaging Bank and the Russian Export Center. By the time, like I said, in the longer time, by the time Ajita Ajakuta comes on stream, you have a lot of improved effects on the downstream and the upstream of the mining sector. There are about 14 minerals that will go into a production of steel in, Aja, in Ajakuta, while the product from Ajakuta will enhance uh, productivity. On, like those companies, the rolling mills have been shut down. We have Castina, we have uh, Joss, and we have Oshogo steel rolling mills. These companies were meant to be the off-takers of Ajakuta products. They've gone more rebound while Ajakuta is down. With the resolution of Ajakuta, 
of course, these companies will come back to life. The Oshogo uh, tool manufacturing company will also come back to life. Other ongoing initiative for this sector to stimulate the growth of the industry include the following. We are working with several stakeholders to design mining specific credit enhancement instruments. Miners will be able to access long-term finance at concessional new rates through these instruments that we are putting up. Private sectors are being invited to come into this process so that the fund is not just from government, but also from the private sector. And of course, our miners will be the better for it. We are generating integrated geoscience information that helps in the risk in the mining sector. This is, of course, the ongoing uh, NIMEP, National Integrated Mining Exploration Project. These are already yielding very good results. The final result is not out yet, but it's already yielding good results for us. And these had been the results we take on our international roadshow when we go for Ndaba, the PDAC, or we go to London. The target minerals in this nine map include gold, platinum group metals, nickel, chromium, lead zinc, bayrite, iron ore, and copper. All these is already yielding results. We are getting uh, investors interested uh, in Nigerian mining sector. The mineral economic corridor, which I was uh, I already mentioned, is to address the infrastructure gap in the mining value chain, such that people can move their products from the mining centers to the ports and of course to market overseas. To help along with this, there is a private sector initiative, the C-Link, which is to use our internal waterways to move this heavy product, not just relying on the rail and the road, which might have some limitations. Presently, there are about 31 states of the country that are connected to the internal waterways. So efforts are ongoing to procure flat bottom badges and move a lot of these products uh, via the waterways. This is the ceiling project uh, coming through Nexim Bank. Finally, with support from the administration of President Muhammadu Buhari and his drive towards diversification, job creation, and sustainable revenue generation, I am confident the Nigerian mining industry is on track to reach our goal of 5% GDP contribution in the next five years. Our target is by 2025, the mining sector should be contributing about 5% to GDP. Uh, I'm sure that our panelists will do further justice uh, to this. They will take it from there and expatiate on how we can get to this uh, laudable figure of 5% in 2025. Thank you so much for listening. And I'm once again, I thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister, for giving us an update on what the ministry is doing to help the, the mining sector to recover from COVID and then to continue the reforms, sustain the reforms. We've heard what this, about the structural reforms that you're undertaking in the ministry to create an enabling environment for the private sector to thrive and to make the Nigerian mining industry internationally competitive, and also to turn the artisanal mining industry from being uh, menaces to you know, solution providers in, in terms of uh, generating jobs. We thank you also for letting us know what you're doing in terms of value addition, uh, retaining value within Nigeria, and moving us away from being exports um, dependent on the export of mineral commodities to actually adding value within Nigeria, creating jobs uh, and so on, and also stimulating um, infrastructural development through the planned economic corridor project and what you're also doing to close the gaps in terms of um, revenue losses. So because of technology, let's just move forward quickly. 
and we'll start with the panelists, uh, the, sorry, the, the um, discussants today. We have about six uh, people. We're going to start with the with Alaji Mohamed Kankara. He's the president, Miners Association of Nigeria. He has been the president since 2019. He's a graduate of business administration from the Bayer University, Kanu. Before he ventured into mining, he spent over 30 years of his career as a senior customs official and has experience in international experience in experience in international trade, imports and exports, imports and exports and facilitation. He's also the chairman, the mining trade group of NASIMA and the vice chairman of the West Africa Chamber of Mines, amongst other national and international assignments. He's joining us from Kaduna, where he's on lockdown. Thank you. Alaji, please, can you start? Thank you. Unmute and start. Yeah, um, thank you, Amanda. Uh, good morning, uh, Honorable Minister, uh, uh, Architect uh, Adebite, uh, the Minister of Mines and Steel Development. Uh, good morning, the Minister of State, Dr. Ogba, uh, the Permanent Secretary, Federal Minister of Mines and Steel, CEO, uh, Nigerian Economic Summit Group, and uh, panelists and other discussants. Ladies and gentlemen, let me stand on the existing protocol. Um, the COVID-19 has come. Uh, it came with negative impact on the world economy. Uh, just like other industries, it has caused serious disruptions and crisis in the operations of already weak and fragile mining sector in Nigeria. Nigeria mining sector is dominated by over 90% informal, artisanal and small scale miners. And this ASM are responsible for over 85% of the mining activities. Preliminary survey has indicated that there are over 5 million artisanal and small scale miners in Nigeria who comprise largely the percentage of women and youth. Uh, these people solely depend on mining activities for their survival. Uh, to borrow a, a, a word uh, from the Honorable Minister at one time, these people are or more or less, we call them the pathfinders of the, of, of the mining uh, industry in the sense that they gallivant from one mining site to another, trying to locate where it is uh, rich and vulnerable, even though they are ill-equipped. Uh, Hello, are you with me? Yes, we are. Okay. And we can um, see you uh, now. Okay, okay, okay. So as I said, the, our miners are more or less uh, ill-equipped, artisanal, who don't have much in, in capacity, capacity of knowledge, capacity of uh, fund. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we, we find ourselves in a situation where the COVID-19 has now come to you know, degrade the sector to, to the lowest ebb as far as our own activity is concerned. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to hear what the Honorable Minister has just said with all the juicy and the, 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 the very uh, enticing uh, programs and roadmap that the, the ministry is putting on place for, for, the, for the mining activity to thrive. Um, but that notwithstanding, I think we have to look at the present situation right now as it is. What do we do for the sector to, 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 to revive? What do we do to bring back the life of our millions of actors? Presently, uh, at the onset of the COVID-19, uh, due to the instructions given by CDC and the World Health Organization, where that is called, where it's called for the self uh, distancing and uh, isolation, I made an instruction 
that all miners should stay away from their mining site as much as possible to avoid contact and contagious uh, nature of, 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 of the pandemic. So we now find ourselves in a situation where mostly they don't have much to do. They, they will still, most of them look for how to make it possible for them to, to, to strive, to survive. So now that it is easing up, the government has to look at us and say, what do we do for you? What we want is a situation where, one, just like what has been going on in the agri sector, let the government look at us like the Anko Borrower scheme that has been operating. If you look at the agricultural sector today, it has climbed up because of the support the government has been giving them. And I believe if there is any sector now that needs that support, is the mining sector. We, the additional and small scale miners who constitute the majority of the mining activity, we need that support of, uh, of financial support in such a way that we do it our people can now have something to start with. Uh, can that is, I have three minutes more. Three minutes? Three minutes. Oh, okay. So, so this is what we, we want, a situation where the government will look at us and say, okay, we need, uh, we, we can provide like funds, uh, equipment leasing, um, capacity building, and uh, even the, the financial institutions should now shift their focus and provide more financial support to the mining sector. All the trapped funds that are meant for the sector should now be tracked and be made available to us because there are so many funds that have been made, earmarked for the sector, but they are trapped somewhere. Let the ministry and other uh, uh, concerned bodies come in and see that this money is being made available, not in terms of cash, even if it means buy equipment for equipment leasing in such a way that this activation is being made possible. And uh, also uh, there should be a situation where this local, because we can afford to make raw materials available for the local industry, like the Manufacturers Association of Nigeria, they then come and partner with us to can provide as much raw materials for the local industries. Um, we also want a situation where the CBN can also look at it for the for 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 all the programs that it is doing to activate other sectors, so that we too we can benefit from it. There should be manpower development and capacity building. The formalization and business linkages of the ASM should be made to, and to, 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 uh, to, to, to become a reality. But one important thing that is very key in this sector is that whatever activity that the either ministry is making, the Ministry of Mines, or other uh, bodies like CBN, NEXIM, or any other financial institution, we should be brought into the scheme, into the system, because we are the main actors. We know who the, where it pinches us, so the Miners Association of Nigeria wants a situation where anything that is going to be done, let it be invited, harmonized, and then let us key in so that we can be part and parcel of what the activity of the government is going to look like, especially the, the robust promises that the Honorable Minister has just uh, showcased now. Thank you. Thank you so much for keeping to time, sir. And we got your comments here to mainstream mining in the national economy. We need to do more of that. And also to mainstream miners association into the forefront of any discussions around the mining industry so that we have yes. your input. And I liked your um, suggestion to, to strengthen or basically um, strengthen that link between miners association of Nigeria and Manufacturers Association of Nigeria. You have a, a symbiotic um, relationship uh, that needs to be nurtured. And you're in the right place. We are in the Mining and Manufacturing Policy Commission. So we will work hard to make that, um, that marriage work. Uh, thank you also, we your, noted your comments also for the government to do more 
it, to sort of replicate the agricultural revolution um, success and replicate that in mining. So thank you. Now move on to the second discussion. Uh, this is Dr. Abdurazak Garba. He's the Director General of the Nigerian Geological Survey Agency. He is a member of several societies and also a fellow of the Nigerian Mining and Geosciences Society and the Geological Society of London. He has more than 30 years in the mining industry with specialization in mineral exploration and assessment. He's currently, as a DG, he designed and is currently implementing the ongoing National Integrated Mineral Exploration Project, which is an effort of the federal government to de-risk the mining sector and attract investors. Dr. Garba, your background, okay. You have 10 minutes starting from 10.48. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amanda. Good morning, the Honorable Minister, Honorable Minister of State, the Permanent Secretary, uh, distinguished uh, panelists. Good morning, everyone. Thank you once again, Amanda. The, um, uh, um, uh, the, the, the assignment you give me, you gave me is a Herculean one because uh, discussing so many things that has to do with uh, the mining industry, especially uh, from the Nigerian Geological Survey angle, is a uh, is a mission impossible in ten minutes. But I will try and do justice, beginning with uh, trying to explain a little about the functions of a uh, geological survey, what we do. Basically, geological survey we do science a lot of things, which includes geological mapping, geochemical mapping to physics, both airborne and ground. We do a lot of uh, mineral valuation assessment and so many other things. Uh, our vision essentially is to become a proactive, open, flexible, and knowledge organization working actively with our partners. Then our vision is to become the ultimate referral point for geoscience information and knowledge using highly skilled qualified personnel cutting edge technology in collaboration with stakeholders. Now the Nigerian Geological Survey, I would say is about the oldest institution we have in the country because we are more than 100 years old. Exactly we'll be 101 years old in 2020, this 2020. With this background, you will agree with me that Nigerian Geological Survey has been generating science information for a very long time. Let me recap some of the things we have done in recent times so that I don't go into the archives. We produce or we have been doing this assessment of several political commodities, which include zinc, copper, coal, et cetera, et cetera. We have published quite a lot of publications, about 50 bulletins, records of geological survey, and occasional papers. In the recent past, the NGSA, in collaboration with the first uh, phase of World Bank, we did the urban survey of uh, the whole country, where more than 2 million land kilometers of urban survey was carried out across the country. We also did geochemical mapping with uh, the BGS. We carried out investigation of uh, carbonate rocks across the country, whereby we were able to determine that we were able to push to the source of the country from about, as a limestone, from about 4 billion tons, metric tons, to about 10 billion metric tons. We have also completed the investigation on phosphate in Nigeria, I think the Solid Mineral Development Fund. The NIME project, which uh, Amanda just mentioned, and uh, the Honorable Minister Ampam said, is being driven by Nigerian Geological Survey. And as said, the focus of the project is to, uh, to pro provide geoscience information that can attract, rapidly provide to science information. Now, the NIME project itself is a type of necessity in the sense that the structure of Nigerian Geological Survey for a very long time followed what the colonial masters left us. But the reality of time 
and the focus of the present, present administration suggests that we need to do something more because we need these investors so that we diversify the economy of the country. So based on that, we designed what we call the National Integrated Mineral Exploration Project to look at several commodities. These commodities, we at the NDSA driving the project, then the contractors and the consultants doing the work in partnership with us so that our staff, the staff of the ministry, will build their capacity to be able to do this. And what we stated at the beginning is this, that these projects must be driven by competent persons because we have to pay, play the international politics and also do things the way they should and learn from them. Recently also, we constructed a new laboratory complex in Kaduna and by the grace of God, immediately after this COVID is over, we are going to install a new fire assay equipment and carbon and sulfur analyzer to put up our activity. We are also in negotiation to secure an ICP-based ICP analytical facility because any country that wants to develop its mining must have an ICP-based uh, analytical facility to carry out analysis to service the mining industry. So we are working on this. Now, that is where the Nigerian Geological Survey is. What do we want? post-COVID, or what are we doing based on the, uh, the, the, the social distances that is uh, engendered in the uh, COVID, in the COVID situation we find ourselves worldwide. The minister mentioned something about the data center. We agree, all of you will agree with me that information drives the mining industry. Availability of information makes this very, very successful. And this has been made recently. The just data center, which is a collaboration between BGS, NGS, the ministry, Mindava, will provide a leverage for us to get all our data sets in digital format. What this means is this. Investors don't need prepared data. That is data, complete data of exploration and so on and so forth. They also need information to take design. Different layers of information will be made available on this data center and to be available. Investors. The NTSA has a brand new website. This website has all the information so as to allow accessibility for information, or at least it will provide a link for you to know where we are. So I implore all the members of this audience to look at the NTSA website. We also have a very good website to share information on the DINET project. The, 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 the website is being populated as normal for any website as soon as new information is coming up. I also want people to look at this. The carbonate data we have done is also there, whereby when you open the, an IMAP, when you open the web, website, you can see information on location of a marble, a marble or limestone deposit. If the resource has been calculated, the analysis, these are to provide information so that without necessarily coming to NGS, you can get this rudimentary information to make your investment decision. Also, we cannot work without our partners. Dr. Garba, two minutes more. The NGS, yeah, please. Two minutes more. Two minutes, okay. In collaboration with uh, Nigerian Society of Economic Geologists. We will have a webinar that the activities of the NIMEP, where we are, what we have done so far, and what we have done will be shared with the public. At least, un I mean, unclassified information will be made available by competent persons that are working on here. Then, also, uh, the, the consultant will also future on the webinar to provide information for post-COVID NGSA and our strategy. In summary, our approach will be demand-driven and our programs will be multidisciplinary. Our culture will be proactive and our task response will be solving problems, solving problems, solving problems, especially in the mining industry. Our products and uses will be flexible in flexible format, like maps, reports, databases, digital information, through the geodata center or through our website. Information technology usage. We are going to 
make active use of information communication technology and knowledge management. Stakeholder involvement. We have been doing with Miners Association. We have procured some ICPM, I mean, uh, handheld SRF analytical equipment to allow us to penetrate deeper that is at our zonal offices so that we can quickly or rapidly do analysis for sample. We are reviving our mineral clinic so that people can have access to us at the zonal and state level, carry out rudimentary analysis that will direct the course of their exploration efforts. With this, I think I believe I must have uh, done justice to, to uh, some aspect of uh, the, 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 the focus of uh, adapting Nigerian geological survey agency and its working method to promote investment in the mining industry. Thank you for the opportunity to come to be on this platform. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Garba. Honestly, you are doing a lot of things. I don't know how you cope. Uh, what Dr. Garba and his team at the NGS say they're doing is to revolutionize um, the mining industry, really to make it internationally competitive. Data is what drives um, investors to a mining nation. Completely. And for you to be a mining nation anyway, you have to have data. Uh, DRC, we hear about DRC, there's so much going on, you know, conflicts and so on. But investors are flocking to DRC. Why? Because they have data. So we are, you know, um, so what Dr. Garba has just basically done is highlight the kind of investments that the federal government is making to, uh, has been putting into um, building our geoscience architecture. And I, I was very happy to hear that, you know, alongside your bringing in ICT, you know, innovation, digitization, which is the advice from the um, executive secretary at the Economic Commission for Africa. That is really what we're going to use to um, recover ICT, digitization, innovation, and technology. So I'll move on now to uh, Amira Waziri. She is a technical assistant to the Honorable Minister of Mines and Steel. She's going to speak to us on trade and economic impact of COVID-19 on the global and Nigerian mining industry. It is 11 o'clock. Amira, you have 10 minutes. So you'll be done by 10 minutes after 11. Thank you, Amira. Amira, is there a problem with your connection? Okay, we can see you now. Amanda, is it possible to share my screen? It's not letting me. Okay, oh my gosh, we hadn't even done that. You just need to enable it, otherwise I can talk through it. Okay, I'll just talk through it. Okay, just start and we'll see. Okay, start counting from 11 or two. Good morning, ladies okay, and gentlemen. Okay. My name is Ami. My name is Amir Adam Wazi. I'm a technical assistant to the Minister of Mines and Steel. Um, thank you, Amanda, for the introduction. Um, allow me to please stand on existing protocol as I'd like to get uh, straight to my presentation. Um, when it comes to the impacts of trade and economic uh, 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 impact of COVID-19 on the Nigerian mining industry. Initially, the picture um, appears quite negative, but when you look deeper, um, there's actually some silver linings to the story. Um, we've seen uh, real life market players like largest tin exporters um, report gains from the pandemic. We've also seen other um, gold refiners, particularly in Oshun, Elisha, um, that have also reported positive findings from the pandemic. 
this uh, uh, these success stories um, paint uh, a positive picture for other Nigerian minds to emulate. Um, in achievement of uh, ministerial and presidential mandates of revenue generation, job creation, and economic diversification. Um, Nigeria has seven strategic minerals, and for the purpose of my talk today, I'll touch on just four of them. Um, looking at the global landscape, China um, paints uh, uh, and sets the overall mood and direction for the global mining industry due to um, obviously their high influence on the demand for base and industrial metals. On the supply side, particularly from emerging markets, so Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa, um, we've seen mines have uh, uh, supply disruptions due to lockdowns and restricted measures put in place to control the virus. The other angle I'd like to look at the global outlook from is from the aspect of base metals versus precious metals, which paint two very different pictures. On the base metal side, particularly from aluminum, zinc, and copper, we've seen an oversupplied market, which has led to price declines, um, but, uh, mainly due to a fall in demand as a result of uh, subdued industrial activity in Europe and North America, although China has been particularly resilient. Um, in terms of gold, which is the main precious metal I'll be talking about today, um, the uncertainty related to a second wave of, uh, a prospective second wave of the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic partnered with its appeal as a safe haven asset, and also a weaker dollar have led to price hikes thus far. But looking towards the end of the year, I like to maintain a cautiously optimistic outlook um, mainly because uh, when you look at the impact of recycling or scrap gold into the market, particularly from India, there's potential um, for the supply from those markets to balance the demand. Uh, unfortunately, I can't share my screen, but this is a, there was a diagram um, just further showing the oversupplied base metals market. My presentation will be available afterwards. Over the past five years, now moving to Nigeria, we've seen an exponential growth in mining contribution to GDP. Now at about 0.26%, um, although we're still a long way from the 2025 goal of 5%, as mentioned by um, the Honorable Minister earlier. The interesting part of um, the local supply and demand uh, dynamics in Nigeria um, comes when you look at the impact of the COVID-19 lockdowns on um, the local market. So lockdowns and travel restrictions created a false sense of oversupply, not because our miners were producing crazy amounts, but because their, so their production remained constant. And as, as it remained constant, um, off-takers were wary of uh, buying, um, mainly because of uncertainty as to market conditions moving forward. This then created a strong buyer's market and led to a sharp uh, fall in prices. For zinc, we saw pr uh, price tanks of 30% within the first month of the lockdown for tin up to 40%. And these prices have now rebounded as the lockdowns have eased. Gold as of yesterday stood at 22,700 Naira per ounce. This is local gold, gold sands, not bullion bars. Um, and that just, that's a testament to um, how volatile the markets can be. That said, key players have used this as a strategic opportunity during the lockdowns to actually stockpile. Malco Mines reported um, stockpiling one, over 1,000 tons of lead during the lockdown period and 400 metric tons of zinc. This is between March and June, which they are stored in warehouses for trading at a later time when spot prices have risen. Um, Alhaji Cairo and Sons, which is uh, one of the key agents for Kyan Smith Gold Refinery, has also reported positive impacts for artisanal and small scale miners um, as they are benefiting from the higher local gold prices. Finally, I'd like to touch on shipping and logistics. On the global scene, dry bulk shipping, uh, which mainly concerns coal and iron ore, has been most affected by um, the COVID 19 pandemic. In the first half of the year, dry bulk shipping has suffered a lot, um, mainly due to supply restrictions, due to lockdowns from uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and also a fall in prices due to lower demand. Um, China, however, has bucked the trend. 
a fall in the oil prices um, was translated uh, by China as a result to actually stockpile their oil reserves. And as industrial activity continued, coal and iron ore demand sustained, which was a positive for major miners as their output um, uh, remained uh, stable. Coming back to Nigeria. Sorry, reports, Amira, do you still want to share? Yeah, sure, I can share. Because <laughs> I think you're getting a bit animated, and I know how disappointing it is not to have shared this. Okay, so we'll give you a few more minutes. Okay, thank you. Let me just go back quickly. I want to show the, the chart on prices. Mm -hmm. Okay. So these are the price price fluctuations during the lockdown. Um, you can see that tin fell um, from 6.2 million in March down to 3.7 million in April. Zinc fell from 100,000 Naira per ton um, to 70,000 Naira per ton, but has now rebounded to 105,000 Naira per ton, which is higher than the prices that we observed even pre-COVID. Um, gold has had one hell of a bull run and is now at 22,000 Naira. Nigerian ports have suffered um, greatly. We've seen a 75 decline in port revenues, mainly because majority of our exports um, going through the ports are oil related. And with the tank and oil prices and oversupplied oil market, um, this has not been great. Um, particularly for the Orne port in, in Port Harcourt, which is um, where majority of our oil cargo passes through um, as it's an oil and gas free trade zone. However, I see this as an opportunity for solid minerals to fill the gap. Now that um, our ports are free, um, or rather relatively freer, um, partnered with the historical lack of um, port infrastructure to support oil and gas shipments. So the lack of gas pipelines and, store, and, and enough storage depots, um, these ports can now be utilized for solid mineral and dry bulk cargo. Um, I also wanted to just touch on inland movements, so haulage and trucking, which were relatively um, much less affected by the pandemic as the ports remained open and commodity transit uh, carried on. Um, however, haulage prices did go up which is a, a cost uh, downfall for producers. These are the top three countries that Nigeria's solid mineral exports go to, China, Malaysia, and Thailand. Um, you can see they're all concentrated in Southeast Asia, which has been one of the most resilient regions in the world in response to the global pandemic. And moving forward, we expect it to improve. Um, finally, um, just looking forward, um, the Central Bank of Nigeria weakened our official Naira dollar exchange rates, i.e. the Naira depreciated. In the short term, this will pose challenges, but it actually makes our exports more competitive in the long term, yet another opportunity for solid minerals trading. Um, as the pumps, as, as the pumps had rightfully mentioned, um, the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement and the Africa Mining Vision is now more important than ever. Um, now that we've had a reset, it's, it would be great for us to focus on the implementation of those so that we can um, uh, spur regional cooperation. Um, and I think some African governments have actually made incredible, incredible um, and dynamic responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. Congo is providing training to artisanal and small scale miners on social distancing. Burkina Faso and Ghana virtually treated mining as an essential service as gold mines continued to operate throughout the pandemic. And um, the Rand refinery in South Africa, which is um, Africa's only accredited gold refinery by the London Bullion Market Association, adopted a dynamic approach to the challenges faced by um, the pandemic. So instead of shipping the gold bullion bars through commercial flights, as usual, they actually um, uh, opted for plane charters. Um, relating this back to my introduction, um, we've seen some uh, very key 
and important uh, local Nigerian mining companies and mining trading companies um, show some resilience and dynamism throughout this pandemic. I think this is a great opportunity for other um, local players to emulate um, the uh, strategic uh, moves made by these companies and also contribute to the growth and development of the mining, the solid minerals industry. Um, and with that, I'd like to close off. I am open and free for any questions later on, but if not, this is my email and my LinkedIn. So feel free to shoot me an email. Thank you. Thank you, Amira. Amanda, back to you. Yes, thank you. You, were, you should have seen your face during your presentation. You're very animated. So I forgot to give a background to Amira. She studied BSc uh, Geology. She has an MSc in Metals and Energy Finance and worked as an equity research analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence. And she's the founder of Bulgari Mining, Bulgaru Mining Ventures, which is a mining consulting and trading company. Uh, what I took from your presentation very quickly is that, you know, mining, the markets are, are also as volatile as the oil and gas industry. So that's very important for the, the, the federal government and you know, um, all interested stakeholders. When we're saying diversify from oil into mining, we need to understand that we're basically saying diversify from a volatile market into an equally volatile market. But uh, mining provides the opportunity uh, to support broad-based development, which is what the African mining vision um, you know, encourages uh, African countries to, to, to adopt. I will be talking about that later on. Amira mentioned the African mining vision that it is even more important now with um, what COVID has done in, essentially to the, to the continent um, because of our dependency on, on commodities. Uh, she also talked about um, you know, the ASM sector, how they're benefiting in spite of the, the, the confusion and the disruptions and so on. So, uh, it, it's a good thing that the minister also mentioned that ASM development and formalization is key on their priorities. So we now move on to the next person, uh, Dr. God knows Njoa. He's an executive director with the metal and mining sector at Ernst & Young. He's based in Cape Town. Uh, he's going to speak to us about COVID-19 global disruptions, impact on the African mining industry and investments, recovery strategies and the future of mining and metals. He started his mining career in 2001 as an underground gold miner for Rio Tinto in Zimbabwe. He has a mining engineering undergraduate and postgraduate degree and a doctorate degree in mineral asset valuation and financial reporting. His expertise lies in mining engineering, mine management, corporate finance, accounting and corporate governance. Also, mineral asset valuations, technical and economic reviews, mineral business improvement, uh, mining taxation, mineral resources and mineral reserve estimation, and etc. He's also completed a number of mineral project evaluations and due diligences for investors globally for various stock exchanges, including the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, the Australian Stock Exchange, the Toronto Stock Exchange, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, London Stock Exchange, and the AIM, uh, which is also in the London Stock Exchange, in a wide range of commodities, diamonds, gold, platinum, iron ore, manganese, limestone. Uh, importantly also, he's also been involved in the creation of the International Mineral Reporting Codes and Valuation Codes in South Africa and other mining hubs. His experience cuts across several African countries, um, as well as the United Kingdom, Czech Republic, and so on. So, Dr. God knows, your, I, I, I read this out because we're going to be doing a lot of things in the, in the ministry on a lot of these issues that you've covered. Thank you. Go ahead. He wanted okay, his um, presentation to be shared. Has it been shared? Okay. So you're okay. starting at 11.17. You have 10 minutes. That is, I'll stop you at 11.27. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks Amanda. 
with uh, time, I think uh, all protocol observed. So I'll go straight into my, uh, into my presentation. Uh, if you can move uh, to the next slide, please. Thank you. So in terms of uh, one thing that I think we can uh, all uh, certainly uh, understand uh, in these um, uh, times is uh, in mining, uh, the only certain thing that we can uh, know is uh, uncertainty. So in terms of uh, looking at uh, the mining sector, I think uh, it's, uh, mining is not going to be in any exception to any other uh, industries. I, I think, as you can uh, see, I think um, from the uh, Anton Guterres um, uh, pointed out to say, okay, recovery from COVID-19 crisis must lead to a different economy. And I think we have seen that uh, uh, with our even our personal lives today, that uh, what we used to do three months, uh, maybe three, four months ago, we cannot, um, uh, we cannot do anymore. So from that perspective, I think mining is not, um, uh, is not a, uh, an exception. So, and one thing that I think we, uh, we also need to, uh, uh, to realize uh, is with this uh, global pandemic, uh, there is issues that is going to leave as uh, permanent structural changes that needs to happen. And mining is not an exception. As much as um, uh, this COVID-19 is unprecedented, and uh, 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 the world have not uh, seen this uh, this before. It's um, it's uh, something that we need to change and uh, be dynamic and agile to be able to uh, uh, to deal with the uh, challenges that it faces in our uh, day to day lives, and uh, especially in mining, in terms of how we operate. Um, if you can imagine operating. Um, uh, in an underground mine where we are supposed to be social, uh, socially distancing. I think that's a very uh, uh, difficult uh, thing to do. So with that, I think my key takeaway, if I don't uh, get to finish my presentation, uh, is to say, I think the greatest challenge today uh, in the, in the uh, minerals industry is how do we manage a crisis? And as leaders, uh, how do we uh, manage that crisis in a, uh, in a view to say, okay, we sustain our businesses, our, econo uh, our, our communities, and governments. In that particular case, I think my key takeaway for, uh, for this is, I think we are going to see uh, more around our trust in terms of our license to operate, our collaboration. I think uh, we are going to see new collaborations that we have not done, uh, we have not seen before. And uh, we need to also change in our mindset. I think that is one thing that we, if we can do that, I think it would, uh, uh, will make us better as we go on to the, uh, to the other side. Then the, uh, the other thing is uh, automation. I think we have not uh, seen uh, automation uh, or we've not applied automation uh, the way uh, we should, uh, taking full advantage of it. I think with this uh, pandemic, I think it is going to uh, uh, lead us to that. So in terms of um, the mining sector, I think uh, different mining companies have been affected and uh, I've put uh, a couple of examples in terms of how the mining companies uh, are helping countries uh, in terms of uh, donations to make sure uh, the, uh, the, uh, the countries can uh, uh, fight this pandemic. Because uh, if the countries are affected, it also affects uh, these mining companies. So in this particular case, uh, they had to come together uh, to fight the common cause. And uh, once, uh, if this uh, uh, pandemic is defeated, then, uh, uh, the mines can uh, operate, they can do what they are uh, go, uh, good at doing. Uh, can we move on to the next um, slide, please? Thank you. So in terms of um, sector performance, I know uh, a, my previous, uh, a previous speaker has spoken about this, but I wanted to uh, maybe share some uh, uh, couple of highlights to say, okay, if you look at uh, mining and oil and gas, I think uh, all the, uh, uh, the mining and oil and gas if, um, uh, if go I have gone down and uh, for uh, different reasons, and if you look at power, power has also gone down. The only uh, sector that uh, might have not gone down, or has gone down, uh, uh, not to a large extent, but it has rebounded is the technology sector. So the, uh, the, the, the point there is uh, uh, we are not an exception. I think mining is uh, actually uh, much better uh, in terms of uh, what uh, we can consider. If we look at the pricing, I think uh, there is an opportunity that uh, from a uh, Nigerian uh, mining industry or industry in Africa, we can uh, take uh, uh, care of that. If you look at um, uh, the commodities, I think there is only gold uh, and uh, iron ore that has 
recovered or sustained very well in this um uh, in this market whereas um the best metals are uh, have uh, all suffered because of uh the um uh, the demand and supply and the oversupply of the commodities so one uh, thing to point out is uh if you look at um uh what is uh uh in the market i've just uh, i downloaded uh, some information about projects in nigeria that are uh, are being either explored uh, or are being uh, uh, developed or are being uh, evaluated. I could see that there is um, about 15 uh, core projects that are, are being listed on this um, uh, global database. And there is 10 gold projects and there is 11 iron ore projects. And if you look at my uh, exploration uh, uh, spend uh, globally, you can see that um, when there is a pandemic or when there is a shock in the system, uh, exploration is the first uh, uh, to be cut off or to be suspended. You can see that in 2000 and, uh, 2009, you can see that in 2016, and you can see that uh, it's also going to happen in, 20, uh, in 2020. But the, uh, the interesting uh, uh, part is if you look at um, where the uh, commodities, uh, are the, uh, the focus is, uh, gold and iron ore and copper, I think are, are, are metals that are in favor. So it's, it's for us to take advantage of uh, this um, phenomena and uh, invest in these, um, uh, in these sectors because um, it goes with uh, the favor of, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, economies and uh, which uh, commodities are in favor given the demand and supply. So uh, can we move on to the next slide? I think this also shows uh, uh, the same picture but uh, with a, uh, a longer, uh, a longer uh, profile. So I will not uh, uh, elaborate on that. Uh, next one. So one important thing that I wanted to, uh, to show here is uh, if you can look at um, uh, the forecast uh, for 20, uh, 2020 to, 20, uh, uh, to 2024, there is uh, interesting statistics around, let's say, uh, nickel and uh, other base metals. So I think it's uh, other things that uh, we should be um, looking at and be able to uh, prepare for uh, such investment. But if you don't have the exploration uh, data, it will be difficult to, to take um, uh, the benefit of uh, these high commodity prices as the, uh, the market turns. And, and uh, if we uh, move on to the, uh, to the next slide, I think it's um, what we can see is uh, there is different uh, stages in terms of your, uh, your uh, mining projects. And what we can see is the impact of COVID-19 uh, given what has happened now, most of um, uh, the exploration um, is kind of on hold or um, commodity and company dependent. So what that means is if, uh, the, commod uh, if the commodity that you are exploring is uh, um, uh, in favor or it can be supported by fundamentals, uh, those uh, projects uh, will see uh, them uh, being uh, restarted earlier than uh, the other projects. So what we can say uh, at this time, uh, the gold, uh, coal, iron ore that those projects uh, uh, would be um, uh, would be uh, would be progressed whereas the best metals might be suspended because uh, the outlook is uh, looking negative so in terms of um, uh, the ones that are uh, already in evaluation uh, maybe uh, back uh, one slide please the ones that are uh, the ones that are currently in um, uh, in, uh, in evaluation now I think uh, they will continue to uh, they would have to um, uh, to design the mines in a, using a different philosophy and a different methodologies, taking into account uh, the impact of COVID-19. Because previously we had not seen uh, such uh, 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 pandemics in the world, and mines were designed in a different um, in a different uh, uh, methodology. And one thing that we are also going to see is all projects that are going to be uh, started uh, uh, from now going onwards. I think they are all, all going to um, uh, leverage uh, automation and um, uh, uh, they're all going to leverage uh, automation and uh, uh, technology to see what can they do and uh, with uh, with a less number of people but more people would be uh, in um, uh, central hubs where they will be operating the mines uh, remotely from uh, from where they, sh uh, they, sh uh, they, sh uh, they should uh, uh, can you go back uh, one please one uh, uh, okay thank you so in terms of um uh this is uh, I, I think uh, uh the important slide that I, if i i have i don't have to do any other slides i think this uh will have given 
I think what uh, what we need uh, to look at. So I think um, uh, as 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 uh, in the mining industry, I think we need to look at um, the scenario planning to say, okay, what are we going to do now, and what have we done now, and what are we going to do next, and what are we going to uh, do beyond um, uh, uh, this COVID nineteen. So if we look at um, uh, in terms of business continuity, what uh, we have uh, we have done now, I think uh, the uh, the world have um, uh, have reacted to COVID nineteen with speed and uh, and responsibility, with social distancing, uh, government backed lockdown schemes uh, have been effective to slowing the spread of uh, of the COVID uh, of the COVID nineteen. So in terms of that, uh, we are uh, the shock. Uh, we could uh, see the shock, and um, uh, companies are restarting. So the now I think is, uh, has been uh, kind of resolved. I think uh, companies are starting to uh, uh, to work, obviously with uh, cautious restarts, but they're starting to work. Then the next question as leaders that we need to look at is what do what do we do uh, next in terms of uh, being uh, agile and how do we use technology uh, uh, technology to uh, to derive uh, exploration? How do we st uh, restart um, uh, exploration? How do we do? Uh, uh, leverage digitization to reduce cost and increase productivity then the last uh, which is our uh, uh, beyond after the uh, so this is the uh, what i would say the new normal what are we going to do uh, with uh, the new normal so we need to um, uh, develop uh, new business models that will work uh, in terms of this uh, uh, fundamental because the old business models are not going to uh, uh, to be resilient because of uh, the weaknesses in terms of how we have managed to uh, uh, to plan or to design our minds. So we need to reshape our operations. And one important thing is uh, for us to re uh, to revive our uh, economies or our countries, we need new collaboration. Uh, this is uh, no longer the uh, age where uh, private sector and communities and governments work in isolation. I think we have seen uh, with the impact of COVID-19 that the private sector, the governments, the communities, everyone has come together to solve the common enemy. And I think that is an, a, uh, an important issue that we should um, uh, take going into the, uh, into the beyond. Uh, next slide, please, thank you. So in terms of, uh, in terms of that, I think uh, from this perspective, I think commodities, I think we have uh, been uh, moderately affected. There is other bar sectors that have been uh, affected. Um, God knows you have exceeded by two minutes so try and wrap up please okay thank you so in terms of uh, that i think uh, uh mining i think uh impact has been moderate uh we can go to the next uh, slide please so in terms of uh, i think social distance i think we have uh, uh spoken about that i think the important part that i wanted to share here is uh, this is a balancing act so nothing is uh going to work i think we need everything to be uh, to be balanced and uh once uh you can uh, balance uh, uh uh, the risks and the opportunities, I think we'll be able to uh, to move on. Next slide, please. So I think uh, the key takeaway, uh, the key takeaway for me uh, uh, from uh, from a, a, a mining in Africa is, I think mining and metals uh, uh, poses an opportunity for uh, to play an important role in terms of building um, our economies in uh, in Africa. The question that we need to uh, to look at is how do we collaborate more between governments, private sector and our communities uh, because in my view this is a win-win situation the issue around um unpredict uh, unpredictability of our, fin our financing sources i think in africa has always been a challenge and i think uh with new collaborations i think we should be uh, looking at new ways to do uh the uh the, uh, the funding then the last uh, uh uh thing that i said is a, a missed opportunity for me is i think the lack of available cheap power uh, in Africa, I think is we have lost in a, a key opportunity that we should have uh, captured. But in my view, it's not too late for us to uh, make uh, correct uh, corrections because most of our production that comes out of Africa gets refined abroad, and we should be uh, looking at uh, putting an enabling um, uh, environment for that beneficiation to be done in the countries where the minerals are are, are washed. And I think for me, that's a one missed opportunity that we can correct and collaborate so that we can get more beneficiation in the countries where the minerals are, are, are being extracted. Uh, thank you.
Okay, God knows, sorry, can you just explain what you meant by the missed opportunity? Sorry, just so that you wrap up with that. It was, okay, so um, your voice was shaking. Okay, so, uh, sorry. So I was saying uh, the, uh, the missed op uh, opportunity is, if you look at uh, the amount of uh, minerals that we uh, is produced in Africa, uh, start, uh, uh, let's start from gold, co uh, 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 let's start from gold, let's go to platinum, let's go to chrome, uh, lead, zinc. All these minerals, if you look at most of uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the smelting and uh, the refining or to convert to our finished product is done, uh, is done abroad because uh, uh, they consume a lot of power and that's why they're being done abroad instead of the countries where they sh uh, the uh, minerals are, are being um, are extracted. So my uh, opinion is if we can get uh, the enough power to make sure that uh, this, um, uh, this uh, uh, smelting and uh, beneficiation is done locally, I think that will create jobs, that will create revenues for governments and that to uh, create uh, even jobs for uh, uh, for the local economies. In that, uh, thank you. Okay. Thank you. You had a lot to say in, in, in a very short time, but thank you for doing that, really. So what I'm getting from this is that we really need to uh, build this sector to be resilient because in the future, there'll still be external shocks. So how do we you know, build resilience into the mining sector, even as we're trying to recover. And also from what I'm also getting, Dr. Garba, is that um, going forward with NIMEP, it would be good to look at how the market is responding during this COVID, speak to market analysts and try and have an idea of where the market is going. He's given us an idea of gold, iron ore, platinum, chromium, lead, zinc. So you might need to reconfigure the, the um, NIMEP program and put those uh, commodities that the market will respond to earlier and try and get them out on the finish, you know, the product line. And I'm also getting this um, sense that we should um, collaborate more in the industry and a collaboration between the government, the private sector and uh, communities. And actually this is what the Nigerian Economic Summit Group provides. It's a platform for public private dialogue. And we've already, partnered with uh, the Ministry of Mines and Steel is our main partner. Uh, we also have various associations, the private sector, and we're going to build around the African mining vision going forward. We already have that framework in place. I will mention that a bit later. And thank you also about the issue of um, power for the mines, and um, not just for, for mining, but also for downstream. The ministry is also pushing hard on uh, value addition, beneficiation, smelting, um, adding value to our minerals. Uh, you know, so we have to also strengthen that relationship between the Ministry of Mines and, you know, the, the power industry. And again, we're, we provided that platform under the Nigerian Economic Summit Group for that to happen. So I'll move on now to the next person, uh, Dr. Tochuku Wachuku. He's the CEO of Preston Consult. He's going to be speaking to us on the macroeconomic impact of COVID-19 and the implications of Nigeria's policy responses to the mining, to mining sector recovery. He is an economist, he is a public policy expert and chief e executive officer of Preston Consult, which is a research and management consultancy based in Abuja. He had variously served as a special assistant on financial sector to the Nigerian president, technical advisor at the budget office of the Federation and the head of economic intelligence and was the head of economic intelligence in one of Nigeria's top banks. He was also a visiting scholar at the IMF in Washington and the research, a research fellow at the African Economic Research Consortium, Nairobi. Dr. Nwachuku has consulted for the African Development Bank, World Bank, DFID, UNICEF, European Union, Union World Economic Forum, Open Governance, Government Partnership, ETC. Dr. Nwachuku, please go ahead. You're starting at 11.36. You will speak for 10 minutes. To be done, sorry, 11.37, so um, 12.47. Sorry, 11, for, sorry, from 11.37. Yeah, 11.47. Thank yes. you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Amanda. Um, I'll very quickly go um, ahead to just uh, very briefly explain um, 
the macroeconomic impact of COVID-19 before looking at the uh, policy measures we should be looking at uh, in terms of opportunities for the mining sector. So basically COVID-19 impacted Nigeria via what we call a twin shock. So the global and domestic um, shocks um, as a result of the pandemic and then the also related oil price shocks. In fact, sometime in um, uh, tw um, April 20 or even May, May 2020, all prices fell to negative in some places. And then effectively people were being paid to come and take all crude oil free of charge. And then the question to ask is why um, is Nigeria, Nigerian economy vulnerable to these external shocks? The first thing is that uh, we depend on the global economy for, first of all, the bulk of our government revenue. Secondly, for the exchange, um, foreign exchange inflows into the country, about 90% of that is dependent on, um, on oil. Third is the fact that um, a good chunk of our external debt is also external in nature in order to fill our huge um, budget deficits. And lastly, the capital inflows we need in order to, um, for economic activities also mainly come from uh, external sources. So because of this, we are very, our economy is very vulnerable to external shocks. And I'll look at the, the impacts on Nigeria from the, the, these twin shocks. Um, the transmission mechanism is in three, three, is through three uh, processes. The first is the supply shock. A second is the demand shock. And the third is the financial shock. And I'll just go through them very quickly before going to the options for for the mining sector. In terms of the supply shock, the main exporters or the main countries we import uh, goods from are, the, are China, the United States and European Union. The European Union is a block, of course. And each of these uh, blocks or countries have been the epicenter of the epidemic at some point or the other, starting from China, then Europe, then, um, then the US. And because of the pandemic, most of them locked down. When they locked down, the demand reduced uh, for our oil, and then and also for all the exports that we, um, that they all the things they export to Nigeria, all the goods they export to Nigeria. So precisely because of that, that had impact on our economy. First of all, um, it put pressure. So when we're not able to get the raw materials we need, as well as the finished products we need. So what happens is that raw materials uh, that the industries need in Nigeria become more expensive because they are scarce. Then also the finished products also because they are scarce become more expensive. What, that, what then happens is you have inflationary pressures. In fact, inflation increased from about 11.98% at the end of last year to about 12.4% um, um, currently. Then, um, then in terms of demand shock, the first thing is the oil. Because we're not able to export our oil, there's demand, the demand for our oil reduced drastically because of the pandemic. We're not able to export all that we're producing. The prices also fell sharply because of the glut in the market. Because of all of this, our revenues dropped significantly. In fact, the government had had to um, review the budget and reviewed the key parameters significantly. For instance, all production was reduced from uh, 2.18 billion barrels per day to 1.8 million barrels per day. The benchmark for oil was reduced from $57 per barrel to about $28 per barrel. Exchange rate also depreciated from officially from 305 Naira per dollar to 360 uh, Naira per dollar. Of course, at the parallel markets, we get it for much higher than that. Revenues also, in terms of what we had initially in the 2020 budget and what we have in the revised budget, moved downward from 8.42 trillion Naira to 6.64 trillion Naira. And the deficit almost doubled from 2.17 trillion Naira to 4.17 trillion Naira. I just gave these figures to show us the implications and the impact that this twin shocks have had on the economy. So in addition to revenue falling sharply, we also have public debts rising astronomically. They have already risen um, almost tripling in the last um, five years from about 12 trillion, 12.6 trillion Naira at the end of 2015 
to currently about 33 um, trillion. And if we are to actually uh, plug the deficit, both for this year and um, going into the future, we might still need to increase this um, a little bit further. And then for, um, for debt servicing also, debt servicing will also increase. Already debt servicing eats up about 60% of our budget ordinarily. And this will continue to increase because we need to borrow more to be able to implement even this reduced um, budget. States, the implications also are both at the federal level, but also at the state level. The state majority of states depend significantly on um, FAC allocations to run their, their various states. With reduced FAC allocations, the states will struggle. Even before this, some states were struggling to pay the 18,000 Naira um, a month minimum wage. With this now, and also with the increase in minimum wage to 33,000 Naira um, per month, states are going to struggle. With states struggling, um, individuals um, will also be affected. Many people have lost their jobs. Uh, many businesses are, are closed down or are shutting or reducing production. What this means is that even when the oil uh, revenue reduces, you expect that you'll be able to augment from non-oil sources. But the non-oil sources come from taxes. And if you're not able to tax um, businesses, you're not able to tax um, individuals because many of them are out of jobs then even what you're expecting from those sources will reduce. So basically, it looks as if it's all gloom. From the monetary sector, the financial sector, so the shock is in terms of um, foreign exchange earnings. So because the foreign exchange and earnings have reduced, there's, there will be pressure on the Naira. We've already seen the depreciation of the Naira. We'll also have a decline in foreign, in foreign reserves because the central bank will continue trying to support the Naira. So when you look at all of this negative outlook on the oil price, we look at the looming recession, we look at the increased vulnerability, vulnerability to external shocks. It's not surprising that um, in the capital market, um, investors are selling off um, what they consider to be risky assets, both in terms of um, uh, equities and also in terms of um, fixed in income assets. So very quickly moving to the policy options for the mining sector. I think uh, one clear channel where this will be transmitted is in terms of um, uh, funding for the sector um, from the, um, in terms of the ministry, but also very importantly for the um, private um, participants in the sector. All of this would also affect them because mining is a very integral aspect of the economy. The minister, before, before the COVID-19, the government was already doing a lot in terms of her, um, trying to uh, put the, the sector in the front burner of the economy and make it also a very important um, driver of, um, or contributor to GDP. The minister mentioned already some of the things um, they were doing, but I just wanted to mention that what, two of the key things that for me um, showed the, the fact that the government is interested in making the mining sector one of the key um, sectors in the diversification program is the First of all, the launching of the roadmap, the 2016 roadmap for development and growth of the sector. Then second is also the strengthening of the SMDF, the Solid Minerals Development Fund. And then uh, the board was inaugurated in 2017. Of course, I'm not going to- Doctor, one about... minute more. Okay, that's fine. One so the minute already... more. Yeah, so the government is already up. doing a lot in the, in the sector. But in terms of taking advantage of the of the of COVID-19 and all, all of these issues to improve the sector, I think I agree with um, the president of the Miners Association that um, governments could consider also making mining, just like um, agriculture, um, also an emergency sector, and then um, probably also make them eligible for some of the intervention funds, if not even having a specific fund for the mining sector. I think also what we could do is taking advantage of the roadmap. There is no reason why states and the federal government cannot collaborate in terms of mining. So where, um, a situation where you have some minerals in the state, the state government can decide, okay, look, let's explore this in collaboration with the federal government. We do, we, we get um, private sector organizations, um, we uh, get them to explore, and then we pay part of the revenue to the federal government. It's agreed, the percentage is agreed. Also, states can look for um, 
ingenious ways of um, also uh, ensuring that they don't, because they don't have the money to pay for joint venture agreements, they can give out land because they, they own the land anyway, and then to private sector operators. Uh, and then those ones will give them some shares in the, so that they don't need to um, finance the joint venture. Um, just two more things, Amanda, and I'll stop here. I think also it's important that the um, roadmap, I'm happy that the, the minister also dwelt a lot on it. The roadmap should be implemented. It's a very good one, but we need um, to ensure that it's implemented to the letter, especially with regard to the seven minerals that were identified in the roadmap and which he also highlighted. And last but not the least, I think the Africa Free Trade Agreement, um, Free Trade Area Agreement is a double-edged sword. And um, we need to be very careful and to take advantage of all the all the opportunities that it, um, bring, that it, uh, it brings with it, while also avoiding all the, um, all the risks, because there's also the possibility of um, African countries that are better developed in the mining sector, just coming to dump their own products here. So we need to ensure that we take advantage as much as possible of the, of the uh, good points and also avoid the risks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wachuku for <laughs> giving us a gloomy outlook of the economy. Basically, um, just reiterating the issue that we are too dependent on the oil industry, which is oil is volatile. And so even as we're diversifying into mining, which is you know an equally volatile industry, we need to plan differently. Um, you know, can't, we can't replicate what we've done in oil and gas in mining our economy. In fact, the entire country will just crash. So thank you for, for, for this. Um, and I will now, and I also like what you said about federal state collaboration and with the private sector, we'll look into that. So we'll move on to the next um, discussant, uh, Prince Adetokumbo Kayode, C-O-N-S-A-N. Uh, he's going to speak to us about the role of trade associations such as the Abuja Chamber of Commerce and Industry in building stable, competitive and resilient mining businesses in the post-COVID-19 era. He is the president of Abuja Chamber of Commerce and Industry, where he established the best center for skills and capacity development, disputes resolution center, policy advocacy center, as well as the Abuja Trade Center. He has an abiding interest to radically reform small medium enterprises, funding mechanisms and development. He's a corporate lawyer, tax expert, international arbitrator, uh, senior advocate of Nigeria, Life Venture. He's also on the board of the National Association of Chambers of Commerce, NASIMA, Pan-African Chamber of Commerce and Industry and the Nigerian branches of several binational business councils. This is very important for what we want to do in mining. So, so we're going to count on you for this. He's also served Nigeria in several capacities, including uh, Minister of Culture and Tourism, Labor and Employment, Attorney General, and he was also and just Attorney he was also the Attorney General and Justice at some point, and also Defense Minister. He own, holds the national, Nigerian National Order of Commander of the Order of the Niger. Sir, you are a well-rounded person. Please go ahead. You're starting at 11.51. I will stop you at uh, 10, sorry, 12.01. Thank you very much. Um, all protocols observed. Um, it's very easy for me now because some of the preliminary issues that I had, uh, I will have touched, have been taken care of. Uh, I thank the minister, uh, Elijah Kabru, uh, the president of Miners Association, uh, even Tuchuku, uh, they actually uh, done a bit of justice to what I was talking about. So I'll just start with three questions. One, what does the private sector want from the mining industry? Two, what does Nigeria want from the mining industry? And three, what role can the organized private sector, like the Abuja Chamber of Commerce, or Nasima, or the Miners Association, what role can they play in the circumstances? Now, the first, the first issue uh, which I've been 
touched on by the minister, but which I must emphasize is the issue of policy. The OPS, the organized private sector, wants and must work with government for policy changes and clarity in policy implementation. Some many of the speakers have talked about the, the roadmap. That is a key policy instrument for government. Where are we on it? How are we implementing it? What are the challenges? What are the issues? What is the role of the mining as miners association, the organized private sector, NASIMA, and the actual operators? What is their role in going forward with this um, plan that have been launched since 2016? This is the fourth year. In about two or three years' time, we'll be looking at reviewing it. So how far we've gone with it. So we must work together on this and the issue of cooperation. God knows, Dr. God knows emphasize the point again, and it's good to underscore it. We must work as cooperators and collaborators and, um, and uh, see that any policy of government is tuned to the reality on ground and also uh, for proper implementation. And I can tell you, uh, as a young lawyer, I, I was uh, the first company I registered as a young lawyer for a client was a mining company in 1984. And I was invited to be on board of that company and I had remained in mining since then. And I can tell you that there's a gap, no doubt, between those who are in mining sector and those and the, and the regulators. Now this gap must be closed. Now this gap has existed all this time. It's not as if it's a new thing. It's just that now we must begin to close it. And I'm happy that the, uh, the minister, all the speakers have emphasized at uh, that point. Now, I, the, there are five suggestions I would like to give, which are offered for urgent government concentration. The first one is, we must define the mining industrial strategy. It must be very clear to both government, the regulator and the enabler, and we, the operators, we must define clearly what is our mining strategy. Secondly, we must define the mining industry sectors. Third, we must define the METs. We must make it very clear, I mean, sorry, we must develop the METs, mining equipment and technology services as a sector. It's very, very key. And I can say that there is this, again, all the conversation today has not spelled this out. And I can tell you later, I will show that MIT is so critical to the development of the mining industry. And if the the fourth uh, suggestion is to determine government support. How does government really want to support the mining industry? And if government makes up its mind after consultation, what are the steps and the procedure for ensuring that those decisions are implemented uh, as much as possible to the letter? And five, must determine and designate funding implementation strategy for the industry. The minister mentioned it, all of us have mentioned, all the other speakers have talked about it. What is the strategy that ensures that the funding actually goes, funding, funding actually goes directly to the industry, not in terms of cash, but in terms of, for instance, funding the, 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 the equipment needs for the for the industry, funding the the uh, the data the, the data challenges which the industry has, which of course has been talked about. So. And, in, and I will say, uh, with all due respect, that there are, in defining the sectors, there are, in defining the sectors, we want to suggest that the ministry or the regulator should clearly divide and institutionalize the five mining sectors, which we, that's what we have identified, five, five mining sectors, the one, and support their development on a clear sectoral basis. The first is a precious matter. We have talked about gold. Everybody, all of us here have talked about gold, but gold is not the only product that we have in Nigeria. Gold is a highly, is an industrial mining issue. The ASMs, artisans, Moscow miners, are just, is a child's play to the real gold mining business. It is a highly, it's highly industrialized, and we really have to know the strategy. Because going forward, mining should not be a matter for export. We can, we, we are in a position to use a lot of uh, minerals production will be position to benefit it and use it here because ultimately we, we end up importing processed minerals, minerals that we export raw, we bring them in. So the second one is heavy metals, iron, tin, and so on. 
The third is industrial minerals. There's little talk about industrial minerals, but most of the products of industrial minerals are imported. All the chemical industries, paint industry, most of it, uh, the, 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 the minerals are taken out from here, are processed and brought back to us. So the fourth is the stones, including precious stones and what I call not so precious stones, granite, marble, dimension stones and other. The precious stones include gemstones. We must clarify and stratify that this as one of the key sectors. And finally, the mining equipment and technology service, which should be the, the fifth sector which government must assist to stratify it, to clearly distinguish it so that this uh, issue of mining is not just taken as one sector. Mining is divided into several sectors, and I want to underscore this. Then, so we'll now go to the issue of government support. Government, I, a lot of uh, data have been rolled out by the Dr. Garba, by the Honorable Minister about effort, about exploration, data acquisition, and so on. I also want to emphasize skills development. The private sector can support government very uh, easily on skills development, and that's one of the reasons why we established the best center in Abuja, in Abuja Chamber, as well as the Gemological Institute of Nigeria, which is embedded in Abuja Chamber of Commerce, where a lot of training is being done for the gemological sector. Um, the, the fourth point is the issue of, uh, I've talked about mining equipment and technical services. Now, we know about Australia. Just last week, the Nasima had a meeting with the Australian um, uh, ambassador here, and they talked principally about METs. In Australia, METs, not mining, METs, contributed in 2018, $92 billion to the GIF, to the um, GIF gross value addition to the economy, creating 1.1 million jobs. And it is ultimately a contribution of 15% to the GDP. METs, not mining. So it shows how critical that sector is because it is what produces the minerals and we really need to make this work. How does it work in Australia? The, there's a platform called METS Ignited. It's an industry-led, government-funded, private sector initiative. And the point is this, it is industry-led. That is, the mining industry leads the METS program, but government is funding it and is being run by the private sector. So you see the collaboration is very key to have this very sector working. And um, the, finally, the issue of funding. Funding is critical. All of us have talked about it. Alaji, Alaji, um, the Alaji Kabiru, Alaji Kabiru, the president of, sorry. Uh, okay. Somebody is really disturbing me here. So, Alaji Kabiru, the president of the um, mine association, has talked about this. And the minister to mention it, all of us have talked about it. The issue is what do we do? It is very clear now that BOI or even Development Bank or uh, Nexim can really not fund the, the, this sector. This sector is so critical and it's so oil and compass. It's not like the oil sector where it's just. Uh, the, the, the contribution to skills and manpower development is very, very minor. This is a, an all embracing uh, community based institutions which spreads all over the country. So it's a solid arrangement. And we are proposing actually an economic bank that will include funding it directly, funding the, the entire value chain of, 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 um, of the uh, minerals industry directly, the entire value chain, including all the sectors so that we can really be focused on this. And I'm sure the minister will sleep well, better if he has this, this institution supporting all these activities. So this is, this is one of the key issues that we think uh, that we must, um, we, have to, we have to take on in the process of ensuring that Nigeria gets on with the, the industry as much as possible. Now, I want to talk about the industry development strategy. And the first one is that. Uh, you have one minute to please okay. wrap up. Okay. After, okay. Let me just take the issue of beneficiation. It's very important. It's very, very important that 
we emphasize benefits, processing and beneficiation. And the fact that because most, if we beneficiate, we can actually use most of these products locally. So with industrial mining being pushed by the, the government, SMEs, SMEs involvement in mining operations, a value chain development and processing and beneficiation, I think Nigerian mining industry will be on the right path to, uh, to do. And so what is the uh, Abuja Chamber, for instance, doing about it? I've mentioned that, for instance, we have set up the, uh, the GIN, Gemological Institute of, uh, of Nigeria. Uh, we have set up the, we have done a lot of work in the, the gemological sector. We set up the GMAN, and then we are also working with the Miners Association. For instance, the consumer, the Northern uh, Coalition of Northern Chambers of Commerce, we are working with them to set up a, in each of the 19 states, a mining company per state for their critical my, I mean, mineral that is available in each state. And this is one of the projects which I think government may want to be involved in. So that in the next one year, we'll have 19, 19 mining companies in each state, which will ultimately lead to other states having industries in their critical mining areas. So I uh, have said is um, we are ready to engage and support uh, government uh, in whichever way they want to do it uh, through the Minex. The Mineral Exchange Company is a, is a, is a company that the Abuja Chamber of Company established. They have obtained storage and buying licenses for minerals because we need to create this platform and it must be driven by the private sector with the support of government. Finally, I want to underscore the fact that we are with government buying in. Government officials and private uh, must work with the private sector as cooperators and not competitors, as partners, not adversaries. We all must do our best and it is profitable to do so. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for this presentation and for reiterating the need for the public sector to partner and collaborate with the private sector. Uh, the two are not um, working in silos, they need to work together, there's no competition, there's only the need for synergy. And I, I'm, I'm very pleased to see the you know, initiatives that the Abuja Chamber of Commerce and Industry um, is rolling out in, in relation to the mining sector and developing um, our small scale and medium-sized medium companies. Uh, we look forward to more collaborations with you. We we'll would now move on to the last but not the least speaker, uh, Mr. Eustace Onuegu. Onuegu, sorry. He will be speaking on accelerating long-term shared stakeholder value and leveraging on COVID-19 to rebuild companies in the mining industry and enhancing their corporate sustainability. He is the president and chief consultant of the International Network for Corporate Social Responsibility in Nigeria. He is a management consultant with expertise in corporate sustainability, strategy, and implementation. He is the initiator and host of the International Conferences on Business and Human Rights, and has worked with leading organizations and governments around the world on sustainable development frameworks, including sustainable banking, consumer protection, and financial inclusion, corporate sustainability and responsibility, and corporate governance. He serves as the president and lead consultant of the International Network for Corporate Social Responsibility, INCSR. Essentially, all his experiences and skills are highly important in the mining industry where the focus now is on ESG, environment, social, and governance as basically under the term sustainability. This is very crucial for our industry. Mr. Onuigbo, please can you proceed? Thank you. Mr. So we are starting at 12.06. We'll be stopping you at 12.16. Is there a problem? We can't hear you. Mr. Anugu needs to unmute his mic. Okay. Mr. Anugu, please unmute.
let me try him on the phone. Okay, he's coming on soon. Okay, we'll just give him a few minutes. Okay, um, I think maybe we'll fill in the gap with a few questions. Okay, um, so I'll just list out the questions. To be honest, a lot of them are for the Honorable Minister. Um, Honorable Janet Ademi, President Women in Mining in Nigeria, is asking, can we set up an agenda to assist Nigerians to function effectively in this sector, especially the younger population? You know, with agriculture, they've done, you know, some branding and attracted young people into the sector. So can the same be done for, um, to attract young people into the mining industry? Obina Dike asked further to the measures utilized in the presentation of the minister, what steps uh, the, is the ministry taking to prepare the sector to comply and implement the provisions of sector, section 116 of the Act? I've looked at that. That is the section that deals with the Community Development Agreement. The Patrick Odiegu is asking the minister if he can elaborate more on the low-hanging fruit. Is the ministry ready to provide necessary guarantees for market operators to access funds timely. Can I continue, sir? Okay, uh, no, okay. All right, then Patrick Odiego also asked, what are the procedures for accessing the services and support from the mining police? Is the miner expected to mobilize the activities? Uh, Professor Shio Malomo asked, well, this is for the NESG, and I would answer that a bit later in my, in my, when I start speaking. It is, can the NESG also partner with the special purpose vehicles set up by the state governments for engagement in the mining sector? Mr. Shomi Adeshino asks, how are the other sectors supporting, or how will they be supporting the revival of the mining industry in Nigeria? Otumba Temitokwe Shodeinde asked, the outlook for the sector may indicate an increased attention on illegal mining due to the downturn in the fortunes of most people. How are we ready to combat this? Ogun State is an area of concern. Mr. Eustace, are you on now? Okay. Let okay. me continue. No. Okay, so you... I've noted four questions uh, that it's, I think are addressed directly to me. Uh, yes. If you like, I could go on and respond to those ones. Hello, can you hear me? <laughs> Mr. Hostess, you, you are one of the first to join the webinar from nine o'clock. 
Yeah. When it was I time for you to talk, yes. your internet went out on you. Don't worry. I can, I can empathize. <laughs> So you're starting at 12, 12. Very, very disappointing. Yes, you're starting okay. at 12, 12. You have 10 minutes. So 10, 22. All right. Okay. So um, I'm going to have to start from the COVID-19 COVID situation. Um, um, of course, the Honorable Minister discussed with the Reuters magazine. Um, it was reported that um, I was going to be an Financial increase in the in the mining sector, and it was projected to contribute about three percent of the GDP. Today, he even increased that to five percent. That's nice. Gold, lead, um, zinc, limestone, and the coal was were identified uh, for, for investment and six hundred million dollars was also already attracted for that investment. We just identified that um, there are disputes in the host communities. And um, this is a key sustainability issue, which I'm going to be discussing in a bit. In addition to that, uh, just two weeks later, there was the first uh, the our index COVID-19 case in Nigeria, which was on the 26th of February, and that changed everything. Um, that means that the impact, even just two months after that, on the on the 14th of April. Um, the miners were already asking for, for, for intervention funds from the federal government. That situation, that's just to tell you how the, the situation has become just in two months. And um, then what are the sustainability challenges in this situation? I hope everybody can hear me, right? Amanda? Continue. All right, okay. So now, that's just to tell you how the situation, how bad the situation has uh, become in just in two months. And in sorry, I need to get my so and that makes it difficult because um, then the question becomes: What happened? What is the situation of things? What were the, was the situation of things before? Um, the COVID-19, these are the key sustainability, have any sustainability strategy. Is this being controlled centrally? So most of these organizations do have any key sustainability strategy, no business continuity plan, and some of, most of them are small scale miners. And then there's absolute lack of data. Then the next situation was, I can't change my slides. Okay. Then what is actually corporate sustainability? Corporate sustainability is adopting business strategies and activities that meet the needs of the enterprise and its stakeholders today. So now this is where it differs from CSR. CSR is exactly what it says, providing share stakeholder value as of today. But then corporate sustainability, no, no, sorry, go back to the, last, the previous slide, so, sorry. So the CSR goes a bit, uh, sorry, corporate, uh, um, um, corporate um, um, strategy goes a bit not long, more than that. That's um, to protect and sustain and enhance human and natural resources that will be nice for share stakeholder value of strategy provides for just not just today but also for the future. So why are those companies not able to survive which is even after two months of the pandemic? That means that they has not they didn't have any business continuity plan. They didn't have um, that um, 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 any sort any, any sort of sustainability plan in, that it was implemented that has was inbuilt even for the few that has a business continuity plan that was also inbuilt in that business continuity plan. That's a, that's a serious question. That's a serious issue um, because corporate sustainability recognizes the importance of corporate growth and profitability while also pursuing societal goals in relation to environmental protection and social justice and economic stewardship. Now we're talking about the three pillars of um, sustainability, that is the environmental, 
and the social and um, the economy. So the major, the key difference here, now go back, go, go to the next one, sorry. Go, go to the next slide. So the key difference between this is here is that CSR does business in a way that just does not harm the society or the environment. But sustainability does more than that because it does not harm the society and the environment, but also provides for the future, provides for the uh, stakeholders in the future. So five, six, ten years time that the framework process procedures put in place that provides to protect the environment, to protect the stakeholders, the continue to make profit for the shareholders. So that's the key difference now. So what do we have in place in the short term to as a rebuilding strategy for these organizations in the mining sector for business continuity plan? And that would include pandemic and a pandemic plan. Now, Now, there are quite a number of organizations in the plan, but they don't, they don't have, because we don't have a lot of natural disasters in this part of the world. But as the, the pandemic, the, the health crisis that has now turned to an economic crisis, um, the COVID-19 has taught, I think, everyone a lesson now that the situations can actually arise that would um, be global. So it's just We can't hear you. We can't hear you. Mr. Ayu says we can't hear you. You're on mute. Can the host please unmute Mr. Ayu Mr. Uses has, has muted his mic by himself. He needs to reduce that. Yeah, I really don't know what to do now. What do we do? Um, you can reach him on phone again. His mic is muted okay, from well, his Well, we need end. to continue. So, um, so maybe- okay. Amanda, let me just move on. Yeah, okay. I think uh, we'll just move on. Okay, Honorable Mr. you were answering your questions, so- Yes. Well, uh, the first question is from Mrs. Adeyemi, and of course, uh, she raised uh, the question how we're trying to attract young people into mining. Um, we all must realize the fact that uh, attention is just coming back into mining. Uh, and uh, we need to do this uh, in a way that is going to be sustainable and enduring, so we don't rush into anything. Uh, the first thing, to deliver to 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 deepen the uh, mining sector is we are focusing on certain things that will attract the right people into the sector, and one of that, like I said, is, is the, uh, the data gathering uh, process. That is uh, the NIMEP project that we're doing. The data that we're acquiring from NIMEP is already yielding results when we go on our international road shows. We want to attract young people. We want to attract women and, of course, investors. But presently, we have a lot of Nigerians engaged in mining. So it's not a matter of we want to attract them anew. But the process is not exactly the, what we want, the right one. A lot of Nigerians are engaged in mining now as essential artisanal miners. So the effect we are doing on that whether it's young people, old, any local investors, is to organize them and, of course, provide a basis for them to connect with government. I've said that, and I think it's one of the initiatives that I spoke about. Uh, we've done remote sensing to actually identify where these artisanal miners are working, and we are going out to recognize them, to put them on a database. When this is done, we now organize them into cooperatives it's only at this time that they are able, they are able to deal with government. 
uh, it's so difficult dealing with individuals. Alaji Kankara mentioned that. But you know the way Nigerian uh, thinking is, the average, I'm sorry to say this, the average thinking is that it's a share of the federal government money. Everybody wants a share. And with the money government is giving us, we need to manage it properly. You just want to give it somebody who will not come back and pay. That is why even the money we have given out, the, the, the 2.5 billion from government and 2.5 billion from uh, Bank of Industry, it's been a bit difficult for Nigerians to access. You see, the ministry or, or the government does not have the capability to manage that kind of fund. We don't have such expertise. That's why we gave it to a development bank to manage for us. And we are, of course, we asked them to charge a very low interest. Right now they are charging five. I'm even thinking that we should lower that to 3%. But you must fulfill certain conditions that guarantees that this money is not just your own share of the national cake and you must bring back. So it's an ongoing process, we're doing that. Uh, the second question is on community development. This has become synchronized. non. Nobody can do mining in Nigeria, proper mining, not the illegal one. You cannot do proper mining without coming in with your community agreement. It's important you can't even start. We've learned from the mistakes uh, in the oil industry, the community must be carried along. Uh, and even in the process of the agreement being signed, the ministry comes in as an impartial arbiter. We come in to make sure that we moderate the expectations from the community. And at the same time, we make sure that the investor is not going to cheat the community. And of course, so far, so good. Uh, this has been working well for us. Um, nobody has mentioned uh, uh, the, the Segilola Gold Project, which is a, a poster boy, is a flagship in gold mining. Uh, these people are, are somewhere in Oshun State, and they started the process of uh, building their mine. I was there in early March to do the, the groundbreaking ceremony. That's a success story. They've gone through the community agreement. There are three communities essentially in that area. They signed agreement to them. The expectations are graduated over the years. You know, I've been issued that things they will do, but as the company begins to produce and make profit, of course, the expectations becomes higher. So it's something that is already taken care of. Community agreement, it's very, very important. You cannot do anything. Uh, you cannot start your mining project without having a community agreement with the community involved. Um, the next question was talking about the low hanging fruits. And I think that of course has connected with the way I answered question one. Uh, how operators can access funds. Operators, the funds are there. In fact, um, I took a breather from this meeting to attend to somebody uh, who has been sent by one of the higher officials in this country. It's all on, and the guy brought a, a, a letter to my office asking for one billion naira. And I said, no, the, the funds that we have for now, even we are managing, it's a maximum of 100 million naira to an individual. And I've so directed him. He should go to the bank of industry, obtain the form, meet the necessary conditions, and of course, uh, they'll give this money. It's been proven because some people have already accessed this fund and they're enjoying it as, as of now. So meeting, uh, accessing the fund, the fund is there. We need to grow that fund, yes, uh, and we're working on that. We realized, uh, I think, uh, if uh, 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 the uh, barista Coyote is still on, we are trying to work with the private sector. We need to bring in private sector money as well in, uh, into the sector. Government alone cannot meet that. We want our investors in Nigeria to know that the mining is profitable. They can put their money there and of course realize a uh, good profit. So SMDF is now working beyond government to, I mean, create a fund that is robust enough that will be able to, even, uh, uh, the, the, like the man I'm talking about, that will be able to accommodate him, he wants one billion naira. It's not out of place. But right now with the funds we have, we can only do a hundred million max per head. But accessing the fund, the funds are there, it's not exhausted yet. I think out of the five billion has grown, it has grown to about uh, seven point something billion. We've not even, uh, we've not done 500 million out of that. So there's, the money is there. If you go to Bank of Industry, uh, we've asked them how they can even ease the conditions. Please approach the Bank of Industry and you can access that fund. Mining police. The mining police is exclusively a government thing. Uh, individuals cannot control the police. 
So if there are issues uh, with any minor, you can report such to your federal mines officer who are in the states. If it's something the federal mines officer cannot handle, because the federal mines officer in his own jurisdiction has some powers. He can access the civil defense corps, the police cooperates with them in that state, and they can move. But if it's something beyond the federal mines officers, it can escalate such uh, to the head office. And that's when we can now bring in the mining police itself. Uh, we're working with the national security advisor to make sure that uh, this works seamlessly. Um, and I think the fourth question that, that was given to me that I noted down is on illegal mining, which of course also dovetails into the last question, mining police. We've had some successes in the past. Um, there's the, the political will is there to make sure that we stamp out uh, illegal mining in Nigeria. What we need to do next is to prosecute successfully, prosecute some of these corporates that have been arrested and plans are underway. Uh, we need to make example of some people, you know, to serve as deterrence to others. And of course, plans are on the way to make sure we do this. Some people are, uh, 50, uh, 57 people were arrested uh, recently somewhere. Uh, that's somewhere in, uh, uh, in the north. Uh, in Oshun, about 17 of them were arrested. Zamfara, two of them were arrested. And this is, we are, we are arresting these illegal people. But beyond the arrest, we need to make sure that we prosecute them successfully and let them get what justice they deserve. When this happens, it serves a deterrence to others. And I think we can begin to uh, look towards an uh, uh, illegal, free, illegal mining free uh, sector. Thank you so much. Amanda, back to you. Amanda, back to you. Our moderator seems to be distracted. Amanda. I think. Femi, we take the question. See if Amanda yeah. is already. Okay, sir. Okay, okay. I think she's muted or something. Okay, she's back now. All right. Yeah, my network okay. went off. Okay, what did okay. I miss? All right then. So the minister okay, just I mentioned. I have a few more questions remarks. here. Okay. Okay, sorry, did I miss anything? Can I go on? go on? Yes, you can go on. The minister just finished her his own questions. If you have more questions for him, or is the maybe the doctor that was presenting yes, I have before some questions continue. still for him. Um, okay. So as why I have a question here from the I, have a, I don't know is Mr. Eustace continuing? I can summarize what he wanted, what he started saying. Basically, what Mr. Eustace was saying is that most companies, Niger companies in the in the mining industry, in fact, across the value chain, uh, they've not had any sustainability strategies. Um, CSR is definitely very different from sustainability in mining. The issues of environment, social, and governance are, are very critical. So, even junior mining companies and smaller mining companies uh, who cannot really afford, you know, who they are not um, under scrutiny by um, by the stock exchanges that the larger mining companies are subjected to. They are also going on. They are also facing a lot of um, uh, scrutiny from the financial sector. So the financial sector is bracing up to embrace um, sustainability and environment, social and governance before they they, they lend um, um, money. Um, so even venture capital capital funds and so on. They're really key on, on sustainability. So most Nigerian companies in the mining industry have not adopted any uh, sustainability strategy. So in view of COVID and the tight uh, financing environment for mining, it's become even more important. So as we hear a lot of mining companies in Nigeria asking for the government to make the, the, the funding more accessible, especially the intervention fund for miners, um, they will have to at some point start um, paying more attention to how they interact with the host communities in which they operate in, in terms of the environment and, 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 and the social. Uh, that is really what they need to be able to survive in the future and access funds. And in, at the ministry, the ministry is also working to uh, build the mining financing ecosystem. So get the financial sector 
involved in, in, in mining, um, address their risk perception and, and, and so on. So, but they will, in order to lend, they will have to, it, it will be on them to ensure that the mining company has complied with Nigeria's environmental and social um, and laws and probably even gone beyond that. So I'll go on to the questions. I have a question from Mr. Dele Ayanleke. He's the secretary for Miners Association of Nigeria. He's asking the, the minister, the interministerial committee to develop a comprehensive policy for a Nigerian economy functioning with COVID-19 as highlighted in, the pres in President Buhari's broadcast of 13 uh, April, 2020. Then we have Dr. Boniface Wada. He's with the Nigerian Society of um, Chemical Engineers. He's asking whether a mining license can include establishment of a downstream unit after certain years of working, that uh, this is what made Shell to build the first refinery in Nigeria. He's also asking whether the government's policy to, um, for value addition to minerals would be through domestic investors or international. And he's also suggesting that uh, the ministry should set up a think tank. Well, the think tank is the NESG working in partnership with the ministry. So I think that I've answered that question. Uh, then there were a few more questions from others. I will just run through them. Just give me a few seconds to bring it up. Uh, sorry, just, okay. Sorry, hold on. Okay, we have a question from, or comment from Ambassador Lukoni. He's the DG for Nasima. 2025 is a long way. That's for the target in the roadmap. No, it's just round the corner. It's five minutes to midnight. So we have to fast track implementation of the mining roadmap. And we need the financial sector to come into the sector. Abdul Nuhu Bamali says he hopes there will be contributions on government mining security architecture for our investment plan and also asset access to foreign exchange for key mining equipment purchase. Babatola Deyemi asks whether can a major takeaway from this event be a five year work plan and a mining industry repositioning implementation committee? Well, we have a roadmap in the ministry already. We have a roadmap in the ministry. Uh, then there was a question about the, there was a question about the NESG, whether it can, that was from Professor Malomo, whether the NESG can partner with special purpose vehicles set up by the state governments. Yes, uh, the NESG can provide that, um, that support um, and not just to basically to create that whole ecosystem to talk between um, state governments with their SPVs and other sectors that they need in order to drive mining in their economies, in their states. Uh, leave to the permanent, sorry, the honorable minister to please respond to the questions. And then he has actually four minutes so that we can conclude with the rest of the program. Thank you. Thank you. I'll try to go this uh, as fast as possible, uh, Amanda. Uh, what the interministerial committee? Minister, you have to unmute. I'm. Uh, yeah, you have to unmute me. You that have my, to unmute, sir. My system is unmuted. You're hearing, you're hearing him. Uh huh. Yeah, everybody's him. hearing me except you, Amanda. Honourable <laughs> Minister, you haven't unmuted. Everybody's hearing, hearing me. It's just you. Is it me that is not hearing? Uh, Amanda, is everybody is hearing me? <laughs> Amanda, you have to, you have a problem with your system. Yeah. Every other person uh, yes, hearing you. Thank you. I'll go on. Then we'll brief Amanda later. Um, the interministerial committee, uh, of course, I requested for submissions from us, uh, which we did. And of course, I think it was part of the president's broadcast. Uh, what we think uh, needs to be done uh, for the sector to move it forward post-COVID. And I think uh, is th this uh, under serious consideration, 
as you speak. Um, downstream sector mining license, of course, the the downstream part of the of the business is actually uh, has to do with commerce. Um, we are developing a downstream policy, and we encourage people to get in there. It does not really have anything to do with your mining license. If you wish to come into the downstream to do beneficiation and all that, you key into the policy of the uh, of the sector. The ministry is bringing up those policies, and of the, you key into that, and it's just like any other business, uh, you can do that. So uh, the mining is why it's essential for you to do mining itself. You don't need a mining list to get involved in the downstream sector. It's a business. Uh, and of course, we are doing this with domestic investors. In fact, we're trying to create awareness uh, locally because uh, focus has seemed to be on uh, foreign investors only. We are also trying to create awareness uh, with people who have money that look, you can put your money in mining and of course, reap a bountiful profit. The, uh, thank you for the coming, the target of 5% to GDP by 2025. Yeah, 2025 is just next, uh, next door. Uh, there have been a most iconic efforts in the past, which I'm building on, and of course, which of course should get us to that target by 2025. Things are beginning to crystallize for us, and we should see some exponential growth, thanks for it. Uh, security, uh, of course, I, I had a meeting just uh, on Monday with the National Security Advisor. We are trying to uh, make the architecture, the security architecture more robust with the involvement of the NSA's office. So we can get better uh, security. Access to foreign equipment, uh, to, to forex for equipment. Of course, this is there. Uh, once you have your money, uh, even we, like I said, they, they, there is even a custom duty waiver on, on the equipment. So you can have access to forex. That was a question from somebody. Once you get the money, you get, my, uh, you, you get forex to buy your equipment from abroad. And of course, the roadmap in the ministry, Amanda tried to do, uh, speak on that. It's something that has been done and uh, it's, it, it's not a static document. It's something that we've been tinkering with and of course, adjusting it as we go along. Uh, it's an eight document by now, considering when it was done, but it's not static. Like, like I said, we keep working on it to improve what is there. And of course, to make sure that uh, we are in line with present realities. Thank you so much. Amanda is probably off again. Femi, you want to take Hello. over? Yes. Okay, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Um, I think um, Amanda's having issues with her speaker and things. Um, the the next thing I think we wanted to talk about was uh, if there are any further questions. Let me just check the question log if there are any. Um, let, me, let me deal with the questions. Sir? But let's just go on and round up because, again, you yes. should... Okay, sir. And okay, sir. Me. You can do the wrap up and then let's have the okay, closing. Sir. So, yes, yes, we have a Amanda is going to have like a next step thing, um, like her presentation about the thematic group. Um, I think she had shared it. I don't know whether you can share your screen, please. Um, the from the admin so that we can run Amanda's oh. presentation. Me, okay, Amanda, are you back? Are you there now? Hello, yes, I'm here. Okay. I'm so, here. Okay. So since you are here, I mean, you can go ahead with your presentation. Um, the minister wanted to us to move to the next step. So you can just run the, the presentation about the thematic group and the policy commission. Thank you. Okay. So you can go ahead. All right. Okay. All right. So can you move to the move beyond this please so if you've heard the term africa rising it was a term that was used to explain the rapid rise in economic growth in sub-saharan africa from uh, year 2000 unfortunately so you know a lot of investors were interested in coming into africa to invest uh, you know fastest growing economy and so on uh, we're getting good accolades all around the world in the investment community, but unfortunately that crashed. Uh, we found out that that growth was just really based on high commodity prices, uh, you know, for that long period of time until 
there was the uh, global financial crash and the global commodities crash. Um, so, and then what we found was that during that period, African countries, uh, there were no structural reforms that were taking that, that were undertaken during that period. So we're just basically um, producing commodities, exporting and earning revenues from them and then cons con consuming the, the, the revenues. We're not investing in, in the issues that would um, create long-term economic growth and um, inclusive growth, in, in fact. So um, in terms of uh, resource-based industrialization, uh, we've performed very, we've been, you know, it's been disappointingly low in, in, in Africa, particularly in the natura, natural resource-rich countries. Uh, you know, across Africa, you have almost all the countries, it's uh, oil, gas, uh, or, or mining, but we've not performed well at all compared to other uh, resource-rich countries elsewhere. Now, what are those factors that are instrumental to achieving resource-based um, industrialization? So I'll keep saying RBI going forward. It's technology, knowledge, linkages, development, policies, skills. So in all of this, the central theme is, is policies. It's the government's industrial policies that would, um, would determine this. Um, what has this done? By having putting these fa factors together, what has this achieved for... Um, successful countries uh, that have applied RBI, that have achieved RBI. It has all helped them to improve resource discovery, extraction, um, imp Amanda, we can't hear you. Okay. Can you hear Amanda? Can anyone hear Amanda still? No, we can't hear. Okay. Okay. Is it okay? Maybe they should continue the presentation so that I can just run through the path. Um, so, can you go to the next slides? Okay. Next. So she was talking about you know the various things that have you know, inhibited um, mining to grow. You can move to the next slide. Talking about that RBI, which is the resource-based industrialization and why RBI has been disappointingly low in, in, in Africa and the various challenges and the various issues that have um, impacted that. You can move to the next slide, please. Okay. So basically, um, a number of countries, which are classic examples like Australia, Canada, Finland, Sweden, Chile, and Norway, you know, have used RPI, you know, in a in a growth manner to basically enable them to um, put, make their economies more prosperous and grow, you know, more sustainably. And how have they differentiated this? One, they've improved competitiveness. Um, they've had a policy framework that encompasses um, capital equipment providers, upgrading materials and products and processes. And they've also leveraged to support the broader industry technology upgrading and also catalyze investment in education and created strong institutions. Um, next slide. Um, and we, we, we looked at the case study of the Sweden um, economy and how they used RBI to achieve growth in their industries. Um, one of the things they did was to have specialized academy um, and also an industry driven by innovation and also created close partnerships with various um, academies in the world. And this cooperation across borders, you know, helped to increase their all assets in iron ore and also increased um, issues related to zinc and silver and gold. And, Basically, now they are now a world leader in the manufacturing of mineral mine equipment and also Swedish engineering companies currently account for almost 60% of all underground mining equipment in the world. Um, we can move to the next one, which is Finland, it's almost, almost similar to where they've also developed cutting edge expertise um, in areas of education research to be able to improve their mining industry. In itself. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, then. 
So, so Amanda, you can just can... move back. I'm just going to log in through. I'm using my phone. Okay. Yeah, so I think it's better. Okay. Okay, so Please, let's go back from, to where I was on. and I'll just. Okay, I've actually run some slides. I've actually yeah, moved on. So I don't Finland. miss my thoughts. Let me. Oh, okay. Oops, is, is she back on still? Amanda, if you are back on, we have limited time. You can't go back and forth. Yeah, so I don't lose my thoughts. Me. I'll just move forward. Very quickly, if I go back, it's easier for me to just move forward. So go back again, please. Okay, so the three, I just picked a few countries um, where we will um, learn what they've done. Um, Australia, Finland, and Sweden. They've all built uh, prosperous and innovative economies on the back of their natural resources. I basically leveraged their natural resources to support uh, their industrial growth. And this was basically driven by their policy framework. I can move forward. So these three countries, Sweden, for instance, is now the leader in mining equipment manufacturing. You heard uh, Prince Ade Tokumbo talk about the METs and the mining equipment and technology sector. So from being an exporter of um, cereals and saw wood, and then later to start um, adding value to the wood, producing pulp and exporting that, we were able to um, adopt foreign technology, adapt it, and then innovate. Uh, basically, the, the policy was built around building knowledge clusters. So the minister spoke earlier about building uh, processing clusters. So we need to even, even move probably beyond that uh, to integrate the knowledge institutions, the private sector, research institutes, universities, firms, uh, and so on, build a whole cluster. Uh, the clusters don't have to be close to each other, but basically the clusters that they need to talk together. So... Our industrial policy is critical to um, achieving this kind of transformative growth in the mining industry. So a country like Sweden were able to move from just um, producing um, their, their, their minerals. They didn't even have the technology to produce, to, to extract the resource and to, uh, for exploration and, and process the ores. Uh, they acquired this uh, technology. So they had already become innovative um, economies from you know, their experience with the wood, wood to pulp and paper mill um, industries. So they were able to then apply that into mining to support them to um, extract the resource, process it more efficiently and productively, and then practice safer mining. And from that, they were able to continuously, you know, it was like a moving train. So they will migrate the technologies, the innovations from one sector to the other. And today, uh, Sweden is the leader in mining equipment manufacturing. It has 16 active mines and so on. It's the European Union's leading mining uh, sector. The only automated uh, mine in, in, in Africa, in uh, Mali, it's an Australian company, but the everything, all the automation is uh, provided by a Swedish company. Same with Finland. Uh, today, they have uh, more than 200 mining technology hubs. What did they do? Um, it's basically, you know, that whole cluster, that into infusion of um, cutting edge engineering expertise, excellent education, research, um, and infrastructure. So move on to the next country. Next is Australia. Today, Australia is home to the global mining, to global mining exploration ventures. Now, something that's very critical about all these three countries is that they didn't have the technology. The technology was mostly in the US, so in, in terms of mining. So it took them time, but there was a deliberate strategy to uh, innovate, to adopt the technologies and so on. And so they invested heavily in R&D, in training, in engineering, you know, in the STEMs, building the STEMs capabilities and skills uh, and so on. And now they're exporting, not just exporting minerals, they're exporting their technologies, their mining technologies and, and uh, solutions. The next slide. So the African mining vision was built around the experiences of these um, Scandinavian countries and Australia and how they were able to use their mining sector mining mineral resources to leverage on it to develop their economies 
Um, in, and today, all these countries are now high-tech, knowledge-based industri uh, industrialized nations. So when we talk about mining supporting industrialization, we need to move away from just the value addition, right? It will also need to start looking at the upstream where the industrialization really takes place. Because when you start to produce your own equipment, that is industrialization. And the kind of innovation that goes into producing your own equipment is what you then use to migrate into um, other industries. So the African mining vision was, it's really a continental framework for African countries to use their mineral resources to catalyze their development. You can move forward. The next slide. So basically, the moving us away from being primary commodity exporters to be knowledge-based um, economies, there is no reason why we cannot be like Finland and Sweden. They were also in our position. They were, uh, uh, Finland particularly was very poor, um, had high rates of poverty, sickness, and so on, but they were able to, through a deliberate industrial strategy, uh, transform their economies. Move forward, please. Okay, so this is basically what the African mining uh, vision provides for, for us as a framework to achieve this level of um, industrialization as these other countries um, have done. At the middle of this cycle is resource exploration and extraction. So a lot of African countries need to move away from just concentrating on the cycle, the inner cycle, to linking up with the rest of the economy in terms of uh, backward linkages, which is the upstream, um, you know, the, the equipment and the services and so that need to be put into uh, making the resource exploration and extraction uh, more productive, safer, and um, cost effective. So the whole automation, when we talk about automation of the mining industry, it comes from the, the, the upstream. And then downstream or forward is um, using mineral resources, converting them into raw materials. Knowledge linkages, which is what is very critical to the, um, to the success of those other industries because it, it feeds into everything, you know, it feeds into the backward, the forward and the resource exploration. Uh, spatial linkages relates to infrastructure for mines. Uh, for instance, for you to produce um, iron ore and then to process it and convert to steel, you need a lot of infrastructure, same with coal. Uh, you need large scale infrastructure to open up those mines. And by doing so, you are then providing access to other economic sectors to use that infrastructure. So that's something very critical that the Ministry of Mines is um, working on, economic corridors. So we can move on to this slide. This slide just really says what we've done at the um, Nigerian Economic Summit Group. We restructured, initially we we're focusing really just in a very narrow fashion on, on just the exploration and extraction and then a bit of the downstream. But now we've also restructured the um, mining thematic group into five sub working groups along the suggestions of the African mining vision. Um, next slide. And in, in, in order to implement the African mining vision, that, you know, that for me, that's the beauty of the Nigerian Economic Summit Group, that there are already other um, policy groups and uh, policy commissions and thematic groups that relate to everything that we need in order to implement the, the um, African mining vision through the NESG. For instance, there's the Digital Economy um, Policy Commission. The minister mentioned them earlier. They, they had their own webinar a few weeks ago. So we need to work closely with them. There's Infrastructure Policy Commission, Financial Markets and Financial Inclusion, um, ASMs. We need to include them into the artisanal miners, particularly. We need to include them into the financing ecosystem. So all of these policy commissions will be working very, very closely with them. Now, what does the NESG provide? It provides a platform for public-private dialogue. So um, within the mining thematic group, we have the Ministry of Mines and Steel as the main anchor. We have private sector associations like Miners Association and um, ACCI and ASIMA. We have the um, associations such as the Nigerian Mining and Geosciences Society. 
and so on. We also partner with um, Minor Manufacturers Association of Nigeria. So we have a whole load of partnerships to work with. And we have the experience of the other um, policy commissions within the NESG to achieve this, you know, very broad and ambitious. Amanda, uh, you have overspent yeah. five minutes. Okay, sir. So, um, so what next? What's the next step? Is that after this webinar, we are planning to have a capacity building session for our members. It will probably be uh, two Saturdays from now. We want to help our, our members to understand what the NESG does, what the Nigerian policy landscape is, and then how we're going to work as a group, you know, the, the dialogue with the, the, the public sector, with the private sector, how do we drive this um, collaboration and reforms? And then at the same time also, we'll begin to start operationalizing the sub-working groups. So critical to this is our relationship with the Ministry of Mines and Steel Development and um, other related um, ministries and departments and agencies of the government which are already thankfully on the NESG platform and are used to the idea, you know, this concept of the public and the private partnering and working together. Now, I would like to enjoin our, our listeners, the participants, to please join us if you're interested in mining. You don't have to be a miner. You can be a tech company, a technology company. We need you there. You can be in the education sector. You could be a primary school teacher. We need you there because we need to start building this idea of the STEM and uh, mining, engineering, and so on, you know, innovation from the beginning. If you're in, in the environmental sector, please join us. We'll be focusing a lot on sustainability and ESG and so on and so forth. So please join us. Just visit the, the NESG website. You would find um, the mining, uh, find us under the Mining and Manufacturing Policy Commission and the steps to join are there. We're on LinkedIn. Uh, we also have a private, a very small WhatsApp group where we disseminate information. Thank you for being part of this uh, vision. Thank you. So I must have extended my time. Can we move on to any comments before we move on? Okay. Minister, you have to go to the HMS. It's been waiting since. Yes, uh, HMS, thank you for being so patient with me. us. Thank you, sir. Yes. So I'd like to now invite Dr. Uchechuku Samson Oga, the Minister of State, Mines and Steel Development, to please give us his closing remarks. Yeah, Amanda, good afternoon. Good afternoon the Honorable sir. Minister, Minister of Mines and Steel Development, Architects, Olamileko Adebite, the Permanent Secretary, Distinguished Panelist, the NS, NESG Mining Temic, Thematic Group members, moderators, ladies and gentlemen, I want to start by commending the Honorable Minister Architect Olamineko Ademite, the management of NESG, the thematic group members led by Dr. Laila Jayola, the CEO of NESG, for this wonderful opportunity uh, to make a closing remark towards this uh, post COVID. 19 Nigerian opportunities and impact on the mining industry. I must acknowledge the timely convocation of the conference, especially as government is preparing to roll out its post-COVID strategies to stimulate the economy amidst the many negative impacts of the COVID on the Nigerian mining industry. As chronicled by all the speakers, one major positive outcome of the pandemic stands out. It has reemphasized the urgency of diversification of the Nigerian economy through the agriculture and mining sector. Since the commencement of the implementation of the mining reform programs from 2005, the scale of mining operation has remained very modest with contribution of less than 0.5% to the GDP. Revenue generation from the sector is a form of mineral royalties and fees on mineral titles and licenses has been steady increase in recent past years. 
the Honorable Minister has already revealed our target of 5% contribution to GDP by year 2023. And I believe it is realizable. The mineral commodity which Nigeria produces mainly limestone for local cement, ceramics, manufacturing, stone aggregate, sharp and, di and dimension stones for building and construction work, coal for domestic use as energy source, lead, zinc, tin, columbite, tantalite, and gemstone for export. Why the metallic mineral commodities are predominantly produced by artisanal mining, artisanal and small scale miners. Construction minerals are produced by medium and large scale mining operators with our intervention like the NIMEP transportation logistics and the development of the mining hub clusters as highlighted by the honorable minister production will increase on a very competitive basis with regards to international com commodity trading. Though the impact of the COVID was felt by the operational segment of the mining sector, the degree of impact varies and likewise, our immediate recovery strategies should be, long, should be along the lines of fostering our regulatory capacities, continuous stakeholder engagements with the other tiers of government, curbing of illegal mining activities in the sector through formalization of the artisanal miner, artisanal operators and improved security at the mining areas. I want to lend credence to the position of the Honorable Minister and other speakers that the real economic diversification that is resource dependent comes through the development of a strong side stream linkages and literal migration of strategic technologies. It is the side stream industrial activity that link the, mineral, the mining industry to service several other economic activities. I have noted the key outcomes from the conference, which will help us in policy formulation for optimal performa performance of the mineral and metal sector to yield a desired economic fruit. In trusting forward, to meeting this goal, there is a need to re-strategize by scaling up actions and introducing new initiative to serve as ingredient that will give life to the implementation of the mining roadmap produced by the government in 2016. It is in the line with the objective of the roadmap that I think the post-COVID strategy should be anchored for the purpose of accelerating the development of the mineral and metal sector to meet the yearning Nigerians. Some of the key or additional key initiative that the ministry is implementing as expounded by the minister includes enhancing the productivity by accelerating formalization of the artisanal and small scale mi miners. Alaji Kabiru Kankara in his presentation has commended the government assistance like the anchor borrower scheme in the agri sector. Equipment leasing, capacity building and low interest funding. And the ministry is already working on all these interventions. Driving domestic industri industrialization by ensuring sustainable exploration, production and supply of high grade industrial minerals industrial raw material, facilitating the preparation of mineral deposit to bankable assets that attract private investment and participation. Ensuring mineral value addition by enhancing the development of opportunities and capacities in the mining, op in the mining operators along the mineral value chain to provide a solid backbone to the domestic manufacturing and economic industrial economy, embarking on advocacy and mobilization of potential domestic investors from organized private sector to invest in the mineral value chain by organizing domestic investment roadshows targeted at high network individuals and corporate entities, fast tracking the development of the meta industry 
and other off-takers manufacturing plants as key plant to stimulate local consumption. Depend, deepen our effort in plugging the revenue leakages, especially in the areas of under declaration and reporting of the mining production, restructuring the mineral title administration in manner that addresses the issues of easy entrance and which has littered our cadastra with dormant title blocking serious investors. I'm not aware of the fact all this requires serious funding. The Honourable Minister and I will make a case for government to prioritize the sector in the post-COVID Nigerian economy. Effort will also be made to ensure other funding sources to attend to the needs of the sector, especially in the area of environmental impact mining. I want to say conclusively that the minister has done great by ensuring that this meeting is held today. It was a great opportunity. I want to conclude by thanking the panelists, especially the presenters of the paper, my big brother, Tokumbo, Honorable former Minister of Justice and Attorney General of the Federation and other distinguished presenters at this today's webinar conference. Today's meeting has underscored the potentials of the minerals and metal sector in the diversification agenda of the present administration, especially in the post COVID-19 era. Once again, my thanks goes to the organizers and all participants in this platform. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you, Honorable Minister of State. Uh, it was clear you took a lot of notes um, and, and I'm, I'm really grateful for that. Uh, thank you for, you know, you know, closing things down with um, the highlights from the minister and all the presenters, and really hope that to see these issues integrated into the um, ministry's policy framework as we move forward. I would like to now call on Mr. Femi Awofala. He's the facilitator for the Mining and Manufacturing Policy Commission, basically my needed I boss. To mute myself. Uh, he will give us the vote of thanks. <laughs> Femi, please Thank go you ahead. so much. All right, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you um, to all our panelists, uh, right from the co-chair, um, who spoke early, and also the Honorable Minister, you know, talking um, a lot about what the industry is doing. And we also thank the uh, president of the Miners Association of Nigeria, as well as the director general of the Geological Survey. And, and also um, Am 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 Amira Wazibi, a technical assistant to the Honorable Minister. Um, Dr. Goodnose um, also presented. We, we really appreciate you. And also Prince Adito Kumba Demola, we thank you, sir, for your time and efforts. And also um, Mr. Um, also, we thank you too. And also, um, lastly, um, the Honorable Minister of State that gave us a, a closing remark, um, um, Dr. Tochukunwachuku. Sorry, Honorable Minister of State, uh, sorry, Dr. U Uche um, Samson Oga, um, thank you so much um, for the time. Um, just in closing, I'm sure that um, um, all the slides will be provided. Um, you just follow your email. Uh, um, and also, if you join our, our thematic group, you'll get all the presentations and the deliberations that were made. And lastly, before I also forget, is Dr. Mr. Lao Yejayola, the CEO of the NESG. Thank you so much, sir. Um, even though we didn't allow you to say anything, I don't know whether you have 50 seconds to or 30 seconds to say anything at all. Okay, sir. Simply to thank the Honorable Minister and Pam said, everybody, and for, for collaborating with the private sector and to reiterate the fact that for us as private sector, we're ever willing and ready to collaborate with government. Ours is to ensure that the environment for doing business in Nigeria is very right, and that we can occupy the place that Nigeria rightly belongs. So we will take this forward. And like Amanda did say, there's a lot of things we we'll put together. The policy commissions are huge. I mean, for those who are listening, mining is just one out of 45 
thematic groups. And so whatever you need to talk, the professionals are there and we can always put everyone together. Thank you most sincerely for your time and I'm very grateful. So